Which Mercedes SUV is the best or which one is the most suitable one for you? In this extensive comparison, we're going to find out. We go through all sizes and through the price range with the Mercedes GLA, the Mercedes GLB, the Mercedes GLC, the Mercedes GLE and the Mercedes GLS. In exterior, interior and the driving experience. Tell us in the comments which Mercedes SUV is your favorite and maybe also why. The GLA and the GLP share the same platform. The same counts for the GLE and the GLS. So these two are direct relatives each. It's interesting however that lengthwise there is hardly a difference between the Mercedes GLB and the Mercedes GLC. Still, these SUVs are positioned quite differently as for usage and price. We'll take an in-depth look at all of these Mercedes SUVs and later draw an extensive conclusion for you. Let's go! This is the all-new Mercedes GLA. This new generation here in Autogefühl, your number one resource for in-depth car reviews and your number one community to discuss cars. Thomas in front of the camera and Jonas behind the camera today. Exterior, interior and the driving experience. We'll compare it to the predecessor. What has changed? What's the new emphasis of this vehicle? And since they all share the same platform, A-Class, B-Class, GLA, what are the differences in this respect? So please join us now if you're interested in full HD, full screen and full length. Let's go! The new Mercedes GLA has a strong appearance in the front. It's already sassy in the front. I am more of an SUV now. And indeed, well, it's a little bit wider than before. Wheelbase has been increased just a little bit. And different front grills are available. This one here, based on the AMG line with this diamond pin grill right there. This is so-called Edition or Edition 1, a special launch model. But it's based on the AMG line, so most of the things are actually AMG line, you see. Option, you can get LED lamps. This one here, the optional, optional multi-beam LED lamps with a high beam function as well. And the grey Magno color, a very beautiful one, a matte color. Always a very special one and yeah, probably one I would also consider. The only disadvantage of those matte colors are you cannot polish them. So if you have some scratches in there, that's a problem actually. Other than that, they stay clean, you know, quite long. So and when there's normal rain, they clean themselves a little bit. That would be the pro argument for them. And of course, it looks really amazing. This edition also has red contrast here. Other than that, the AMG line in general has a stronger lower bumper. I would like to know, what do you think here, the new front design of the GLA? 4 meters 41, 14 foot 5 or 174 inches is the length of the new Mercedes GLA. That's a little bit increased in wheelbase as I already said, if you compare it to the predecessor, but the overhang is a little bit shorter, pretty interesting. And if you compare it now to the Mercedes GLB, which would be the bigger brother, this one here is still 22 centimeters or 9 inches shorter. But the wheelbase is identical to the Mercedes B-Class and the Mercedes A-Class. You could so say it's like a put-up B-Class or a way, way, way put-up A-Class. But we'll see more of, about that on the interior. Exterior-wise, you can see that design has been modified, that it's more SUV now, crossover wheel arches, 17 to 20-inch wheels. 
these are the biggest ones 20 inch wheels for the normal models the amg would then come from 19 to 21 inch yeah also with the, then the red contrast here in the normal wheel style so again amg line sportier look definitely you will have more comfort if you go for smaller wheels of course Speaking of comfort, there's a normal steel suspension available, which will also do a fine job. If you want to spend more money, we also have the adaptive suspension here today with this vehicle. That is an option. Then we have a chrome frame around the window here. You can also get the dark styling if you like, but this one here, of course, more elegant. And we have a you know, very interesting shoulder area here, and especially with the matte paint. It's really nice to hug the car then, you know. Yeah, <laughs> that's what car enthusiasts do don't they so and that is also to me um one of the differences it just looks a little bit fancier a little bit more lifestyle-ish suv off-road-ish than the b-class and that could also be an argument to pay a little bit more extra if you compare it to the b-class because most of the stuff is really you know pretty close to the mercedes b-class this one again a little bit more expensive but a little bit more fancy or what do you think and now to the rear with the common design trend of more horizontally drawn tail lumps, but I think it looks quite modern then. Actually has the shape also of the other bigger SUVs at Mercedes. And then there's this chrome design element right there and also chrome exhaust, not really exhaust tips. Fake exhaust police. Yeah, that's a pure fake exhaust. And also on the other side, the real exhaust underneath yeah <laughs> and the amg line has this diffuser here in the lower part so what's the design take This is the car key, slim and light, pretty, pretty nice. Keyless entry works like this, put your hand on the outside or on the inside. You can also open and close the car with your smartphone, NFC that would also be possible. Door closing sound, that sounds pretty solid. And you really have to slam the doors for GLA, B-Class, A-Class, CLA and so on. Not sure if it's the insulation or so, but if you just do it slightly, it can happen that it doesn't properly close, so you really have to slam them always. <laughs> Inside of the doors, you see they are pretty upright, as also with the B-Class, that is for more space on the interior. Here then with the microfiber dynamic car insert and leatherette above that, soft touch, and this is also animal free. Then we have a sporty styling here with the carbon fiber insert. We also control the seats from here and also reasonable space at the inside of the doors. Then this styling from this launch model is with red contrast stitches and so on so you can see it also with the sporty steering wheel for example that is also similar in the normal amg line also then with the aluminum pedals in the lower area so they are also quite fancy of course typical amg line style the rest of the interior is also similar it's a a class and b class as well and these seats here in this case is one of the rare animal skin options also special for this launch model other than that this GLA, together with the other compact Mercedes class, has a wide offer of only fabric, fabric article leatherette mix, full article leatherettes, all animal free. Also then the AMG line usually comes with Dynamica microfiber on the inside, leatherette on the outside. Article Ambitex is their leatherette brand, depending on the market, they are called differently. So. The choices actually of animal free materials that are high grade are almost endless with the Mercedes Compact vehicles. So that's very well done overall, even though it's not the case in this very car. And also how it feels, for example, we had this in the CLA, I think you can check out the episode. It has this white black leatherette option available, which also feels very soft and amazing. And you cannot really tell the difference. So also for this one. I couldn't tell, I needed to check the configurator to see what it actually is. Seating position here is actually quite upright. You sit 14 centimeters or five and a half inches higher than in the Mercedes A-Class. 
same platform but really higher seating position overall and that's actually good so to me it's the most comfortable mercedes compact vehicle i mean yeah together with the glb the bigger brother of course that is quite similar from the seating position in the front just that the glb will have even more legroom in the rear but this is actually quite cool you sit upright you feel this is now like rather a grown-up suv also you can compare to the predecessor gla which more went into the crossover direction steering wheel can be controlled up and down and in and out soon when we get to another perspectives more about these screens you can see it looks like it would be one screen but it's actually two screens soon again more details steering wheel here on the left side by the way will be used for the cruise control and also this thumb control for the left screen right thumb control for the other screen and here for example the volume jog so i think here in the front already quite convincing oh yeah and last but not least the overview has been increased so when you look from the inside to the outside because the pillars are actually slimmer than before you have more shoulder space so you can feel it, really feel at home here and i mean it's 86 or six foot one still leaves some headroom although we have this panoramic roof here um, this can also be opened like this this is of course an option as well. If you want more headroom, then leave out the panoramic roof. Other than that, it leaves you know some fresh air in. You can also close then with this cover, and it's also split to the rear. And then it's quite interesting because we can also um, you know either close it that way or we can try here. Hey Mercedes, close the sunroof. magic that's a cool feature right to show off to your friends and stuff you know and one more mbux natural voice input example hey mercedes drive me to stuttgart mercedes headquarters starting route guidance to stuttgart now the interior overview first of all soft touch materials here top part even here turbine vent style so it looks pretty clean and cool also a little bit different here on the right area if you compare it to the b class steering wheel then with these bright elements and i said earlier here with the right thumb for example to control the right screen and you would use the left thumb if they wouldn't hold the microphone here for the left screen it starts by the way with seven inch screens each on both sides the second option would be seven inch here and 10.25 like this here and then this is the dual 10.25 inch setup, so the top setup. Even the smaller screen comes standard with MBUX infotainment system. And then the top one, of course, also has it. And also with the natural voice input, for example. We'll test it very soon. Levers still left here for putting in the gear. Just put down for the drive mode. And left side then for the wipers and the indicators. Head-up display, soon also more deals to that and to the screens. First of all, here then, the AC unit, the menu, clicking sound. That's nice. Sometimes these buttons here do not seem to be aligned 100%. I'm not sure if it's even possible, but in this vehicle it seems quite okay at least. Then in the lower part, I do have this shut everything, but everything here with the high gloss black catches a lot of um, dust and so on slide this open then you have either an inductive charging platform for your smartphone or especially when you use apple carplay or android auto you plug it in like this then you have two adaptive cup holders right there then there's next possibility to control the infotainment system which would be this touchpad here go back or to the home menu then changing the driving modes we'll talk about that when we drive the car and then there's this parking assistant for example there's a hotkey also to change assistance systems of the vehicle also with the new um, uh, car wash function that uh, the roof and windows everything is closed and the mirrors are full in just with one function when you're approaching a car wash before that only available with the gls and then last but not least here with the armrest covered in leatherette and you flip it open like this then you have two more USB-C chargers there and some reasonable space here it is by the way where you could activate the car wash function when the car is running 
Head up display can also be activated or deactivated here, but I think you will always have it activate definitely. And this is also a function when you search, for example, you can say, hey, Mercedes, activate head up display. That's also, you know, a cool thing to have. Other than that, it is also a touchscreen. Yes, not sure if I mentioned that before, but you know it from other Mercedes reviews here with the new MBOX system. So this is, of course, another way to control it. And the GPS looks like this. So, um, yeah, so actually quite fancy screen as also responsive enough and the carplay integration looks like this here we go doesn't use all of the screen but i think that's also not no not too bad so like this here and this one here is also the optional burmester sound system and for a compact vehicle this has really a nice clear sound so is very expensive yes but if you want the best sound i can indeed recommend it so that's about the infotainment system if you want to see more of that for example there's also this comfort function which is called seat kinetics this is then when you activate it moving the seats a little bit just you know very slight movements during driving to reduce fatigue and there's also an extensive ambient lighting available where you can for example put up the brightness that's what i always do to have it a little bit fancier and of course, a nice color, a multicolor, for example, or I always like the ocean blue color, for example, at the inside of the doors. Or then what's also cool here, you can maybe already pick it up on camera now, here around the turbine air vents in the middle, this is one of the fanciest position where this appears then. A crystal clear view on these digital instruments, so they are actually quite fancy. And you can also change the views here, for example, with styles and display. There's, for example, a sporty view available if you prefer that. This has this AMG style. We also see it in the AMG cars. Other than that, what's also handy that you can put the GPS information right in here. So that's, of course, another good um, use for the digital instruments. And can also be put to full screen. In the head-up display, you can even change the contents you want to see there. Um, of course, the normal speed makes most sense. And then even the left and the right part, you can control what you really want to see there. So pretty fancy. have a lot of options here. I can also hop to the right part, if it, for example. But I mean, I would probably just use the basic function. It's good to have it. Nice option. Everything in your line of sight. Rear view camera. Looks like this. Have the fake drone view from above and also the real rear view camera. And then also the HP helping lines adapt accordingly. And it's a very, very good resolution. And out to the rear, Let's see about that. So it's a very wide opening of the door and also with a beautiful microfiber on the inside, soft leather red around, so it's a high build quality, pretty cool. Also same design then for the rear seats and the whole form also reminds us of the B-Class, surely. By the way, this rear bench can be moved forward and backward if you have that option, not in this very test car here at the moment. But then it would also go forward or backward 14 centimeters or five and a half inches. So the same dimensions like you sit higher than in the A-Class. Interesting, right? Oh, <laughs> I opened the fuel cap just by leaning on it. It's like you can <laughs> open the fuel cap here. Interesting. So let's see. Get inside. And this is, of course, pretty cool. More, uh, more wheel waste in, in the precess and also more usage of interior space so still a lot of knee room left even though this is set to my driving position headroom wise i can even still put a hand over my head and again me even more if the panoramic roof would not be built in this vehicle at the moment there the shade is then closed so and you sit upright very comfortable is a very good family car as well iso fix at the outside of the seats to install these then and you can move around very freely in the rear it's just at the middle tunnel here of course optional all-wheel drive car and also for stability reasons so here in the middle part cup holders but you can also use this just as a ski hatch and just fold this middle part and if i would be sitting just in the middle here that actually works as well so you can really use this car with three adults last but not least in this middle console you not only have two more turbine vents in the lower part you have 
two more USB USB C chargers. 435 to 1430 liters is the capacity figure. Let's see what that does. Electric hatch we have here and very well usable. So it's a slight increase. This is just an additional cover you don't have to use. Underneath here you still have more storage space. It's also subwoofer. So and some storage here at the sides, that's possible. I already flipped half of the bench. There's also a ski edge available that you just flip the middle part. And this cover here, the top one, you can also remove. And let me give you some measurements. So the normal length here to the seat is about 80 centimeters. The width here is actually a little bit more than a meter. And the height here to the top cover is about 40 centimeters. Last but not least, what's then the length to the seating position for me as a driver? And that is 1 meters and 60. So overall, I think you can do a lot of things with the car. You can also reach over here to flip the last of the seat. Here we go. And that's then the maximum setup. And then you get a better impression what's with the luggage and stuff. Here we go. So you can also put it in a vertical way. You can also do a closing test. First of all, for the child safety. Oh, there we go. That's perfect. So it's most of the time at Mercedes that it's so sensitive, really very well done. And yet there's no problem with closing it. And you see also with the luggage there, it's no problem. Now to engines, all four cylinders and yay, hydraulic struts we have here. This is a GLA 250, most relevant engine, turbo petrol engine, 2 liter 4 cylinder, 224 horsepower, optional with all wheel drive. But there's also the smaller GLA 200, 1.33 liter 4 cylinder, 163 horsepower, that then the one from the Renault Corporation. And it will also be available as 250E with the electric motor, so a PHEV then with 218 horsepower system output. But although it's 250 and 250E, the E model is then made with a smaller petrol engine, so don't be mistaken for that. But this one here, the one you can see, is the original Mercedes engine here, the 2 liter 4 cylinder. Then this one here will also be the one for the AMG models, but of course then modified either to 306 horsepower for the 35 model or for the 45, then with 387 or 412 horsepower for the 45S. Last but not least, diesels. 2 liter 4 cylinder diesels, 116 horsepower in the 180D, 150 in the 200D, or 190 horsepower in the 220D. So, yeah, a lot of choices, and the bigger engine then, bigger engines always come with all wheel drive, the middle ones optional all wheel drive, and the smallest ones only front wheel drive. So, that's the normal logic. Welcome to Thomas's Driving Lounge with the all-new Mercedes GLA. Here is a GLA 250. This will be probably the most important engine worldwide for this car. The 2-liter 4-cylinder Mercedes engine. You remember, I told you earlier, the smaller 1.33-liter turbo petrol engine would be the Renault-based engine. So this one in here about the acceleration figure just below seven seconds so with all-wheel drive as we have it here today is a little bit faster this vehicle here is equipped with the all-wheel drive the 4MATIC system also available with front-wheel drive the very same engine all-wheel drive will be relevant for example for alpine regions you know winter regions so to say um, you know for more pure city um, areas it's not that crucial if you have it or not so but we have it here today and as I said a little bit faster and the overdrive distribution is actually quite interesting so usually when we drive here right now is 80% in the front and 20% of torque in the rear so there's this you now this clutch also put some torque to the rear whoa this was the autom autonomous <laughs> autonomous emergency brake also with <laughs> putting the seat belts tight 
uh, because there was a, we were quite fast and the car in front of us was turning and then for a second obviously our car thought maybe that car in front of us coming to a stop and then needs to apply the autonomous emergency brake. One of the serious equipment systems that is inbuilt here and we do have the extensive assistance systems package that also comes with more for example also with the blind spot monitor which we can soon show to you and some other vehicles are approaching us from the rear yeah they are coming they're coming for us so then yeah sometimes <laughs> you need to very ah uh, come on and here we go now there's the red triangle can we see that actually yeah i think we can see that yeah so this is a very good system and if i would put on the turning indicator then it's also flashing and giving us an acoustic warning as well. Adaptive cruise control we can set here, left side of the steering wheel, pretty good and easily to control. Well, about the fuel economy, mm, yeah, I mean, this engine here is actually quite thirsty, so some 9 liters on 100 kilometers, I have to calculate with that, so that's less than 30 mpg, definitely less than 30 mpg US and maybe some more than 30 mpg UK and overall that's of course not really good. Um, if we go to the sports mode by the way, overdrive system changes from 80-20 to 70-30 and let's accelerate 70, well 65 to 100. Oh, that's it. And the sound was actually quite decent and you see also the acceleration is quite decent. So this four-cylinder engine does give us some nice performance and again I changed to the sports mode before so we have a little bit more power at the rear wheels that makes the car also feel a little bit sportier. Also we have the adaptive suspension here built in this vehicle that's an option and um, let's say um, at the compact Mercedes models it does not make such a big difference than with the compact Volkswagen AG models like you know VW, Audi, Seat, Skoda, there the adaptive suspension makes a massive difference, you should always go for it. Here with the Mercedes cars, if you have one of the bigger engines, which is also in this case here, or the GLA in general, you know there are, like with a lot of other compact vehicles, two different kinds of rear axles, one like say more basic one and one more elaborated one. This here, the GLA, always comes with the more elaborated one in the rear already. With the A class, it depends on which engine size you pick. Um, so you can also go with the base suspension and you'll be just fine. Yes, definitely. The dev suspension mm, does make it more comfortable a little bit, but then you can also vary a little bit with wheel, cho wheel choices. Here we do have 20 inch wheels. Together with the adaptive suspension, it's still surprisingly fine. So I expect it a little bit worse. So, but that's surprisingly good actually. If you want more comfort, or if you go for the standard suspension, definitely go for smaller wheels. I mean, 20 inch on the GLA, I think it's also too big and, you know, a little bit more dampening from the tires is surely something that, you know, that would be more suitable, suitable for this car. We can also go, by the way, to the off-road mode that is possible and that would then change the distribution 50-50 front rear. Maximum speed 110 kilometers an hour and it also has, um, you know, effect on the ESC, how that works, that you can drive a little bit better off-road if off-road situation would happen in a Mercedes GLA. Not sure if that's often the case, you know. Anyways, noise insulation is actually quite decent, so we have it reasonably silent in here. It's also a good motorway vehicle because you have this upright seating position. Remember, 40%, uh, 40 centimeters higher than in the Mercedes A-Class. It does feel somewhat similar to the Mercedes B-Class in driving, yes, which is not a bad thing at all, just a little bit higher than, so I would rather compare it with the B-Class. Um, definitely there's a difference to the A-Class, more notable one. With the B-Class in it, I would say this really feels like a put-up B-Class. So, um, but again, this is a good thing, because the B-Class is, um, to me, one of the best vehicles in the Mercedes lineup, price performance wise. Yes, of course, not the most emotional one, but this could then be an alternative here with the GLA, a little bit more this, you know, SUV, emotional, um, 
kind of approach instead of just the compact van. Again, it doesn't feel too much different, but you have upright seating position, pretty comfortable, so it's a good thing that you have a small vehicle still, not with a big exterior length, and still have a comfortable ride, and I think that's, that's also something really cool. So once again, cruise control. So we get off the motorway here, so actually quite good and silent here, behavior on the motorway. Let's see when we put the brakes. Oh, I have actually a good feeling in the brakes here, so can't complain about that. And overall this car feels you know really refined. If we compare the previous generation GLA, it didn't feel so much as an you know like an SUV. This one here now more has this grown-up SUV feeling. That's to me one of the most important things about this vehicle. What they also wanted to change and also to you know, distance it a little bit from A and B class, that this one here is more than, you know, the, the true small SUV. Then you might think about the Mercedes GLB, which is on almost the same platform. Um, so a derivative, um, you, know, you know, like similar uh, building type, a lot of similarities, especially in the front, a um, little bit different from the wheelbase because it's based on the A-Class long platform then, which is sold in China. Um, this one here definitely feels sportier, easier to drive because of the shorter wheelbase. Same wheelbase as Mercedes B-Class and Mercedes A-Class. So it's a very nice and agile ride. Also when you do some lane changes here, for example, that's easily done. So it feels light and easy and sporty to drive. Even though we don't have like a special AMG version here or so, it's really a lot of fun to drive. And that you sit a little bit higher and then I don't feel that the car would move too much or so, so you can still have a lot of driving fun, just that it's more relaxed. So if you ask me from A-Class, B-Class and the GLA, which one would I pick? Probably this one, and the reason is the A-Class is less comfortable to me, especially if you're a little bit taller, seating position-wise, and so on. The B-Class is, is, you know, very good, good car, definitely. Um, also felt actually quite sporty to drive. But then, you know, it has this, you know, compact family stamp, you know, compact family car stamp. So the, the GLA has a little bit more lifestyle factor to me. Yeah, I mean, that's something very subjective and I always do that mistake because I'm so used to drive this. Um, and the, this one here, of course, you know, also just visually wise, you know, from the exterior, a little bit different, looks a little bit more off-roadish and so on. And, you know, I'm also like this off-road guy. I really like off-road cars and so on. So this would be an, more suitable to me. But all the compact Mercedes cars now that's come really close. Also the CLA is on the on the same platform. So there's not so much difference anymore. But I think that's also a good thing because then you also have the you know the MBUX system from standard equipment, even if you have the smaller screens, have the upgraded bigger ones you know. So I have to say again, um, you know, from all the different behaviors, comfort, motorway, it's really easy to steer this car around in the city. The steering is light, but has a good feeling. So it has a natural, natural feeling. Um, then the upgraded assistance system, that's of course very cool. Everything feels really refined and just how it's supposed to be. And on the, on the length of this vehicle on the exterior, you get a lot of car on the inside already. And so there's so much positive to, th to say about this vehicle. There are actually just really two things I can complain and complain about. This is A, the fuel consumption, which is too high, and B, the price, because this car is ridiculously expensive. I mean, three and a half thousand euros extra if you compare it to a B-Class, let's say like a B-Class 250 or a GLA 250 for Medic. It's about three and a half thousand euros difference. But then if you look at this very car here, with the addition one, extra equipment, sound system, wheels, and so on and so on and so on. 
this car, the very exact car we're driving here at the moment, a Mercedes GLA, almost doubles the entry price, you know, which is, you know, depending on, also on the um, engine version or something, 30 something, you know, uh, you can get a decently spec for 40, 45, and that's not even cheap. But this one here now, with everything you see, up around 70k euros. What? <laughs> yeah, so that's probably the biggest problem with this vehicle. Everything else is pretty decent. And now to our conclusion for today with the all-new Mercedes GLA. So, biggest difference to the predecessor is this is now more of an SUV, whereas the predecessor was clearly a crossover. It's also a bigger difference than from the A-Class to this one. As I said earlier, they all share the same platform, A-Class, B-Class, CLA and also the GLA here. And there's still some difference, of course, to the GLB, which is a little bit longer, can also house seven passengers and is just bigger from the inside but this one here already has a very decent size on the interior and especially this comparison exterior length to interior space the same as with the b-class it's really very very good so you have a lot of space especially also on the rear bench although you still have a relatively small car that you can very well park in and out very easy to control easy to steer the whole car feels very refined it's very silent on the motorway, so it's definitely one of the best compact SUVs, no doubt about that, in the very different aspects. And pretty fancy as also for the MBUX infotainment system. The natural voice input is also one of the best on the market here at the moment. So, and of course, you sit higher than in the A-Class, so it's more comfortable, and even a little bit more comfortable if you compare it to the B-Class, but also a little bit more expensive. And that's the point. So many great things about this vehicle, but I also said in the end of the driving part, the fuel consumption is a little bit too high with about, you know, eight to nine at least liters on one kilometers. Uh, so you should get bigger figures there. But, you know, with all the particle filters nowadays, which are good that they have, you know, there's more, you know, pr um, pressure against the exhaust system. That might be one of the reasons for that. Yet again, the overall price for the extras and so on, yeah, that can really be very expensive. So we have to see, probably I would go for this engine, but front wheel drive, because the all wheel drive doesn't make too much of a difference then for this vehicle, unless you really need it. So you can maybe save some fuel, save some money for the entry price. So go for the uh, GLA 250 front wheel drive. And then limit the option list somewhat, because as I said, when you go for this car here with all the specs, it gets so super expensive. Told you that in the driving part at the end of that. Um, yeah, and that's of course the second thing about this car. It's just too expensive. Yeah, but that's what you have to pay then for one of the top in the segment. Glad you joined us for a full review of the Mercedes GLB. Last time as AMG version, this time a more civilized GLB 250. Exterior, interior, and the driving experience, as usual here on Autogefuel, your number one resource for in-depth car reviews and your number one community to discuss cars with Thomas in full HD, full screen and full length. Let's go! The front of the Mercedes GLB is very strong and accentuated, more has an off-road character and that reminds us a little bit of the Mercedes GLK, which was, well, was it the predecessor of the GLC? Maybe. I think rather this one could be a real successor now of the GLK. The GLB here, also more accentuations on top of the hood. The front grille, by the way, in the style and progressive line, looks like this with two horizontal fins and in the AMG line you would get the beautiful diamond pin grille. So in the lower part with the chrome, chrome contrast right there and headlamps, they would still start from halogen. That's the thing with the compact models at Mercedes. You know, I think they should already start with LED. 
but you can of course get full LED headlamps and then optional, optional, these multi-beam LED, they also give you a better high beam function. 4 meters 63, 15 foot 2 or 182 inches is the length of the Mercedes GLB. Wheels come from 17 to 20 inch wheels for the normal civilized version. These ones here are the special 20 inch wheels with the orange ring around in the edition one model, the special launch model. Yeah, I think we can argue about that. 20 inch wheels also maybe a little bit exaggerated here. But for the AMG, the 35 AMG, even 19 to 21 inch wheels available. We had the 35 version in our review before, so you can also check that one out later. It will be linked in the video description and the pinned comment. No matter what GLB version you have, it will always have the crossover wheel arches here to stress the off-road look. And you can get a standard steel suspension or an adaptive suspension, which we also have mounted here today. Then you can get this, you know, shadow line with the black mirror caps, chrome frames around the windows and here in this case and this raising line here it reminds us of the bigger Mercedes GLS has the very same design so you could also argue that design wise it might be a small GLS. What do you think? The side profile I think is not the real chocolate side here of this car. Some even argue that in white here it looks like a stormtrooper helmet. <laughs> What's your take on that? In the rear a rather unspectacular hatch design but also really upright there you can see it's more about form follows function to have more space on the interior modern led signature also in the rear and the lower part yeah this is another case for the fake exhaust police because these ones are pure fake exhaust the real one underneath Yay, we have gas struts here, but no sound dampening below the hood. That's strange. But I mean, the engine doesn't sound too loud, so obviously they can manage without. Hmm, interesting. You start with a GLB 180 or GLB 200, a Vosel Renault powered engine, 1.33 liters, 163 or 136 horsepower, 7 speed DCT. Then today, the GLB 250, the true Mercedes engine, 2 liter 4 cylinder, 224 horsepower, 8 speed DCT. Optional also available with the 4Matic all wheel drive. And then there's a the GLB 35 AMG, same base engine, but 306 horsepower. Then, of course, a harsher acceleration. On the diesel side, there's the 180D, 200D, or then the 220D. That's all the 2 liter 4 cylinder diesel, 116 horsepower, 150 horsepower, or 190 horsepower. And the middle one optional all wheel drive, and the top one always optional. By the way, it's built in Mexico, primarily for our market, so to say, and also in China, but then just for the Chinese market. So, all our viewers, like US, UK, Germany, Canada, rest of Europe, and so on, you'll also get one from Mexico then. Doesn't matter in the build quality, let's take a look. First, the door closing sound. Hmm, that sounds really solid, but remember, in all Mercedes compact models, you have to slam the doors. I'm not sure because the dampening is actually quite good and it needs more, more power then to work against the air pressure. I don't know, but you know, like this, see, door doesn't properly close. So that's the case A class, B class, CLA, and so on, all need slamming of the doors. Then on the inside, very interesting, you get different deco elements. This one here is a matte wood deco element, pretty cool. And mid lighting runs around here, controlling the seats. No galvanized buttons here on the inside, however. And then this is kind of cylindric form, reasonable door pockets. This car is equipped with the optional Burmester sound system. 
even the bass sound systems in the compact models by Mercedes, they sound good. Then you have this advanced sound system, which is a little bit better, more speakers, and then this Burmester is top of the line. They're all actually pretty good, I have to say. Then the interior here of the GLB reminds us of the other compact models as well. Soon more to this two-screen setup. Steering wheel left side for the cruise control. It's a good position to put that here. Left thumb control with this small touchpad for the instruments right there. And right thumb control will be then for the other screen. There are so many seat options available. These here are exceptional animal skin seat, but I say exceptional not because they're so good, because they are rather an exception, as the GLB offers fabric, fabric article leatherette mix, a full article seat in different colors, also uh, color combinations. There's also this uh, white black one mix available, which also offers seat cooling in combination with the leatherette. Then you have in your AMG or AMG line, a Dynamica on the inside, Article leather, Leatherette on the outside. So the overall choice on animal-free materials here at the Mercedes Comic Models is really overwhelming. Let's get inside, such an easy entry. You have a big SUV feeling already. It's not a small vehicle, but based on a compact platform, but a really nice seating position. Steering wheel up and down, and also towards your very smooth process. And I'm one meters 86 or six with one. Frequent subscribers will know and with the panoramic roof here, it still leaves some headroom. If you want more head clearance, then you leave out the panoramic roof. But of course, it's a nice option to get even more light in here and it can also be opened. And then there's also a black shade for that available when you don't want it that hot in here. But definitely a nice, spacious, open feeling. The A-pillar is really upright. That also, again, accounts for this nice open feeling you have here. Seating position is also very comfortable and upright. So I think this is a very, you know, very good offering they have here in this compact segment and among the most comfortable Mercedes models. Yeah, even though it's not a luxury one, just because of this upright seating position and a lot of space you have here. Now looking at this interior perspective, Artico soft touch leatherette dashboard here feels good then this cylindric form at the right side and above that there's again this matte wood this is actually cool but then in this special edition I'm glad it's just the launch model a colored wood that dissolves then into a natural wood ah please don't mix wood with coloring Ugh. i don't know or oh, what's your take on that ambient lighting goes around right there you can see it also beautiful here at the lower sides even more impressive at night then the screen setup is either two times seven inch it's always all digital or then optional you can go seven inch left 10.25 inch right or this setup you always see in all test vehicles two times 10.25 inch also in the smaller version you already get the mbux input where you can say hey mercedes hey mercedes how may i help you drive me to berlin or some other commands. I am those. starting route guidance to Berlin. So um, it's really very helpful, not only for destination input, but also for a lot of other stuff. It's really cool. I will also give some Please examples while driving, for, for example. Zoom more details to both screens. Again, compact steering wheel is a good size for that. Turbine air vents in the round style. This is the way you close or open them. And you can also move them like this. Ambient lighting is also around the vents. Beautifully done. Still the manual climate unit here. I like to have that. Also two zone AC and some hotkeys. So I think that's a good solution. In the lower part, you can close this here, by the way, completely. But a lot of black piano lacquer. Other than that, it's open. And then houses your smartphone with the USB-C cable connection or inductive charging pad. But who would use that when you use the Apple CarPlay or Android Auto with the cable anyway? Then cup holders are also somewhat adaptive here in the lower part. And then you have this touchpad area. You can go for that optional next to driving modes selection and some other hotkeys. Driving modes, more where we drive. And then you open this middle armrest, have some more space underneath and two more USB-C chargers. This is how the GPS looks like. So nice visualization for sure sometimes could be a little bit more responsive so this is in the main menu you can scroll like this right touch but also can use this right thumb here at the steering wheel or the lower touchpad 
So redundant control possibilities. Apple CarPlay, when it's connected, you have the hotkey up here and let's listen to this Burmester sound system, the top option. But as I said earlier, you know it from CLA, even the bass sound system sounds pretty nice. But this one here with a better surround sound, wow. Awesome. This is awesome, man. especially for a you know, compact platform car. Wow. Most astonishing. So yeah, probably one of the best sound systems here for a vehicle in this segment. This is the Apple CarPlay integration. And what else? Maybe in, in, uh, informative, this seat connectors function. It's also an option. And then when you activate it, it moves the seat a little bit by the basic control functions. And that's supposed to you know, increase the comfort a little bit. Ambient lighting, always a great thing here with the color you can pick. Um, I always set it to blue, to Thomas blue, which is called ocean blue here. And of course, brightness all the way up. And then the rear camera here, put the gear lever up to set the reverse gear. It's a very good resolution here with the normal rear view camera. This is the drone view from above. And you can also switch some camera views, for example, entirely the rear or also to the front camera and so on. And it also offers this, yeah, let's say, wheel view that you don't damage those tires. And the camera system, for example, shows also when you want some traffic lights that you don't have to, you know, like put your head down to see them. Or then also augmented reality functions in the GPS um, that the, some signs are being drawn into the screen, for example. And the instruments are pretty clear to read, definitely. So I'm satisfied with that. You can also have the GPS view here in the middle, for example. So then you also see some map information and assistance systems. You can also put to the middle part, or then you can also change the whole style of the display. So for example, to a sporty one, that would look then like this. And some more possibilities, overall pretty nice. And the head-up display is also very clear to read. Current speed, allowed speed, and then also GPS information when you have a route set. It's also a pretty good option. And now where the GLB is really at home, but we soft touch here at the inside of the doors. And this is really so cool. That's how I am seating here in the front and there's so much leg room left. And that's really a better result than MSC's GLC. And also headroom wise, it's no problem, still some room left and again would be a little bit more if I would go without the panoramic roof which is split here but it's also a nice view then up to the top and it's a nice upright seating position here also you can vary it here with this strap you can you know sit a little bit more like this or a little bit more land back this is both possible and then 40 centimeters or five and a half inches it goes to the front and back again um, so you can have maximum legroom or a little bit more trunk area. And this is here the five-seater setup. There's also a seven-seater setup available. And then I tested out it earlier before. You can have some overlay shots for you, but you can also tune in separately to the review if you want to check it out in detail. So what you can actually do if you have the seven-seater setup, when you set the seat like this, that I could still be sitting here, then it would theoretically be possible that you go with two tall adults also in the rear behind it and it's not super comfortable but it is possible really to use this car with seven tall adults however not sure would you go for the seven seater version and please tell me in the comments i think maybe the five seater make more sense you can use more of the trunk area definitely but you know it's definitely a very interesting option other than that Right here, we have the isofix at the outside each. Then we have this middle armrest, you can pull it down. Then you have some adaptive cup holders that fold out. And in the middle part, you have more vents and then two USB-C supplies. 560 to 1755 liters is the capacity setup. You can use this foot kick opening mechanism, by the way. And then we are here with the trunk area and it's really good because it's so high and upright right here. You can see here how you can fit a trolley inside. Um, also, yeah, barely fits under the cover here, but it does work. This cover is, by the way, yeah, see, that's the problem here. So the height here, yeah, <laughs> it's really hard to pull it back then. So this could be a little bit higher, I think. Would be just, maybe the, the missing centimeters are, you know, from here, 
this additional floor mat you don't need to use it you can get it you know um, yeah also can be used from two sides and that this one does not have a rail because of the seven seater setup the optional one this one being the five seater but the seven seater setup is also possible also shown in other videos and now interesting as for the measurements you've seen here this 14 centimeters or five and a half inches bench can be you know put front and back 14 centimeters or five and a half inches and that means either you can have a normal trunk length of a little bit more than a meter one meters five or if you have the seat all the way back, that would be 90 centimeters, of course, you know, about 14 or centimeters or five and a half inches. So that's interesting. This bench here is put forward. This one here is at the back. And you see also one, two, three. It's a three way split. So you can also just put this one down or this one and this one. So you're pretty flexible. And to the front seat, the length here with the flipped seat setup is one meters and 80. It's actually quite good everything and what about the width here this is even more than a meter in width and the height the overall height 76 centimeters just the height here to this you know to this to this cover there yeah that's only about 36 centimeters again like 38 without this additional mat but that's maybe a little bit you know should be a little bit more and then last but not least the loading sill right here is 74 centimeters welcome to thomas's driving part with the mercedes glb how may i help you <laughs> yeah that's the voice activation Can you say that again, please? close the sunroof But I'll stop it here so that it doesn't kill the camera. <laughs> but you see, that also works. So just a voice activation showcase. Hey Mercedes. How may I help you? Open the sunroof. So just have it all the way open again. I'm opening the room the sunlight on the sliding sunroof. I think you couldn't see it now, but you know, roof is open now completely again. Yeah, but back to the review. <laughs> That's live on tape, how to go through authentic experience. So today here with the Mercedes GLB with the 250 formatic. So 250, it means that this one is already the true Mercedes engine. You know, the small petrol engine is the Renault one. This one here, the two liter four cylinder and probably also then the engine to go for. Well, it has enough power, definitely no problem with that. We'll also soon show you some acceleration on the motorway as for that. And it's also, decently silent when you're just cruising and rolling here definitely also the dual clutch transmission is doing a good job to give everything a very smooth transition between the gears we also have the adaptive suspension here today which is a good pick because it really evens out the bumps however 20 inch wheels mounted is not the most clever choice we had the same already with the mercedes gla and it just makes riding so much rougher than you would ride it with the smaller wheels and it's really not necessary for this vehicle i would say leave 20 inch for like big sports cars and so on so it also looks better here definitely they always look better when they're bigger but if you seek more comfort then also leave it with the smaller wheels that will be better for you the steering input is really good because there's no dead zone area no angle of the steering here is dead however mercedes rather has the philosophy of not making it too progressive so you have a little bit more calm running straight for example also on the motorway and then you have you know to work a little bit more with steering wheel just in the way you know in the angles but not really with strength because you don't need much power to to turn the steering and then driving mode wise it also adapts a little bit first starting here in the comfort mode which is giving me most comfort then from these adaptive tempers and especially when we have some bumps in the road then i do again feel the 20 inch wheels and that's so often the case the manufacturers mount the bigger wheels on the cars so the cars look better because they are always well, like like look design is a very crucial buying factor as well but that doesn't do just to the suspension and the Mercedes adaptive suspension here in the compact segment is one of the best there is. But it hardly 
gives a notable effect when you have then the big wheels on it. Yeah. But that also belongs to review, of course. As for the all-wheel drive distribution, well, you do not necessarily need all-wheel drive for this vehicle. You can also pick an engine without all-wheel drive. It is front wheel biased anyway. All-wheel drive just when you really need an all-wheel drive when you live in certain areas where that would be crucial. Other than that, you'll be also just fine with the front wheel driven version of this car. If you have the all-wheel drive, the Euro distribution is 80% in the front, 20% in the rear. When I go to the sports mode, which I can do right now, then it's 70% in the front, 30% in the rear, so a little more rear wheel. And when you go to the off-road mode, then it's 50-50. So that's then the maximum distribution of the rear. Other than that here, sports mode also changes the distribution, or well, changes the throttle input. So you have a little bit more powerful throttle input then. And, you know, this can be helpful, for example, for better acceleration on the motorway and so on. So I'll put you to speed right here and we do some acceleration. Whoa, that's a little bit dangerous now. So 50 to 80. Well, that's it. That was already 50 to 90. And you hear also that the gear is being kept up. So acceleration wise, it's really more than enough. And this was already the AEB, you know, wasn't really realizing that I was crossing the lane. So I was catching the distance to the truck in front of me. So we don't have to be worried about enough power, definitely here. And you know, when you really hit it with the throttle, then yeah, it sounds a little bit, maybe even annoying, I don't know. But that's the thing then with the smaller two liter four cylinder engines. But of course, there's the even smaller one available, so you'll be fine with that car feels really neutral and balanced here. You know, it has a longer wheelbase than the other Mercedes compact models like A-Class, CLA and so on. This one here based on the China long wheelbase version, version of the A-Class, but built in the, um, no, not built in China, but built in Mexico, this one here. So do I feel that it would be driving any worse or something? No, not really. Can't, and no. we already talked about that with the interior build quality. It's not to say, oh, this is a Mercedes from Mexico. You don't really see that here, you know, in comparison to the CLA, for example, we've recently driven. Now testing some assistance systems here on the motorway, setting cruise control here, very practical way on the steering wheel with the left thumb. So that's a very good position to put it right there. We also have the active lane keeping assist. Let's see if it's realizing that we are in a construction site. And I'm, you know, really careful now that I can intervene at any time. Like now, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, that's why we're testing these here live. And some cars do manage it also to be active in the construction site, some don't. It depends, you know. The best results are always when there are two wide lines, right and left, or then, you know, depending on the country, of course, and two yellow lines. But in a construction site, it's really hard for the assistance systems to keep it up. But the ACC that the cruise control here, or I call it this Tronic, is really doing a good job to keep me the, the distance to the car in front of you. That is really, you know, uh, flawlessly done. Really nice. So we also come to a blind spot monitor situation very soon. Um, hopefully some other cars will overtake us. Let's see, we'll go to 100, change lanes, everything again stable and very neutral. They're going slower. No one's overtaking us yet. So let's test then. Setting cruise control. Active lane keeping assist is on. And now we are kept rather in the lane, but it's going quite off the middle there. So not really happy with that. Here it says it's on. Now it should work on the scenery again. Let's see to the right side. That's a good, yeah, that's a better result now. And then, you know, you always have to differentiate between the active lane keeping assist and the run of road protection. So when the active lane keeping assist is not on, and then I get off to the side of the road. Hmm. Usually there should have been a brake intervention, but there wasn't. No idea why. Well, so it was different in the CLA, for example, we recently had. Yeah, sometimes it's pretty strange, you don't really know. 
Hmm. Brake feeling is very good. That's nice. And again, it is an SUV. You have a lot of space in there, but the car really rather feels still agile and easy to move it around and so on. I like to have the menu climate controls. You're also easy to control while driving. So it still feels agile and fun to drive. So you keep the base characteristic of a Mercedes compact segment model, although we have the longer wheelbase here. And I think that's, that's pretty cool. It's also actually more fun to drive than the GLC, almost the same length, but this compact platform is more agile somehow. So it feels a little bit more fun to ease it around. Now we can test the ACC once again. Here the distance of the car is being kept. You can also set the distance here longer or shorter. And behind us is an older GLA generation. And by the way, we had 100 kilometers or 60 miles an hour. Very silent in here, so good noise insulation. And also remark to the GLB 35, the AMG version. This one is way more silent. So the GLB version was way louder also on the interior as for noise insulation. Um, so really more satisfied with this model here, definitely. And to me, the biggest surprise is this is not the AMG version, you know? Yeah, we have the 20 inch wheels. That's a little sportier then, but how good and sporty the handling of this car is, although you can definitely market as a family SUV. So I think that's one of the coolest things here about the GLB. A lot of fun to drive still. And you sit more upright, of course, than in an A-Class or in a CLA. So you have more comfort, especially for taller people, also on longer journeys. And then if you compare it to a GLC, the GLC does feel a segment above. It has, um, you know, the not the you know, most modern MBUX infotainment system. That's an um, advantage here. But then again, the GLC does feel a little more upmarket, drives a little more sovereign on the motorway. Um, but then again, it's not the more practical car. This one here is. So you have more space when you sit here in the front. It's more open building style, whereas the GLC is rather this you know, sportier, closed-in building style. So if you think about the former Mercedes GLK, which was a fantastic vehicle, I see the you know, legit successor of the GLK rather here in the GLB than in the GLC. Although this one is, of course, also then longer than the GLK formerly. But overall, I think, you know, um, it's a very good ride and you have very good, good things here combined, you know. So you have a lot of space in the interior, you still have fun to drive. The engine is powerful enough, but not overpowered and in this case, good noise insulation. It gives you overall a very good driving feeling, neutral handling, neutrally balanced. But then again, to me, as I said, it's so much fun to drive this car still and look at it from the outside. It doesn't look as much fun as it is, you know, so um, that's, I think, pretty cool. So we did um, several things here now. Um, had some acceleration even in there before some rolling and the fuel economy figure is still, let's say, quite OK, considering what we did and it's not too much different than, um, you know, to CLA and, and, and GLA. Interestingly, I've been driving this engine, a two-liter four-cylinder Daimler engine, a couple of times now, different of their vehicles. So let's see, getting in there now. And now you can see also on the right side, the Vance Monte, that is the, the red triangle. And when I set the turning indicator, usually it would also flash then at the higher speed. But that's definitely a very good invention. So back to the engine and fuel economy. So at the moment we are about eight and a half liters on 100 kilometers. So yeah, that's almost the same result than we had with the GLA. Actually with the GLA we had a little worse result, which I cannot make out why that is. Um, I don't know, and I've even driven that on in a calmer part. So although it's the same engine, and this one here is, has a longer wheelbase and it's a bigger car, 
fuel economy seems a little bit better than in the GLA, but I mean, that's just a little bit. Overall, here now, like ambient lighting, we can also see very beautifully done. So we can almost calculate with the same fuel economy. So that would be like 27 mpg US, 32 mpg UK, something like this. With the CLA recently, and also with A-class vehicles with the same engine, we had about 7.5 liters per one kilometer, so about a liter on one kilometer better. So like rather 30 mpg US and 35 mpg UK, something like that. So indeed, when you have the SUV building form, it's a little bit worse. It's, you know, it's not that there's like the world difference, not like so huge, because they're all sharing the same technology. Of course, wind resistance is a little bit higher, so it does make a little bit of a difference, but not the biggest one. Considering now the fuel economy here, I mean, for the GLB, it's of course better than for the GLA, considering the segment, but overall the fuel economy in the Mercedes cars has not been good recently. Um, at the Volkswagen vehicles, the compact ones especially, they have massively upgraded that and massively improved the fuel economy recently. That was really good. But here with Mercedes, not really satisfied with recent fuel economy fixes. Also not in the biggest cars. So there we also, for example, when you compare BMW and Mercedes, better fuel economy result for the BMWs at the moment. Yeah, pretty interesting. Yet again, very relaxing ride. You feel that the Mercedes are set or more on the comfortable level. And also if you compare the BMW and Audis, also in the you know, respective segments, it's usually that the Mercedes models are set out on a more comfortable note, more relaxing ride. And you really have to go to the AMG models to get a stiff or sporty ride. Then again, however, it's really funny that the AMG models then are way stiffer and harder and harsher than the respective Audi or BMW parts with the same horsepower region. So Mercedes then has a big jump from the normal models, which are comfortable, to the AMG models, which are often sporty without compromise, you know, whereas Audi and BMW rather try to get a little more compromise between sportiness and comfort than for their performance models. Very interesting. So now they're getting out to a little bit of a countryside and by the way we do have the off-road mode here since we have the formatic all-way drive as well and I mean you feel actually the all-wheel drive distribution when you are in this off-road mode and you hit the throttle and you feel that it's more even, you're not getting so much pulled from the front, getting pulled and pushed from, pulled from front, pushed from rear at the same time. Yeah, I mean, it's not really good for the fuel economy. Mm, you rather need it for off-road situations only. This car also equipped with the so-called off-road light that you have a constant light at night and more illumination in off-road situations at lower speeds. Usually, however, you would leave it in a comfort mode then. It's actually a quite good ride also to, to leave it then like this. Again, with the steering, it's a very comfortable feeling. This is also what belongs to the overall vehicle, you know, and yeah, you heard, heard earlier we had the Burmester sound system, the optional one. Very great sound for this compact vehicle. And I, you know, also while driving, really like this upright A-pillar. So, because it feels so spacious. Once again, nice ambient lighting here. It's always, I, I've always tuned it up all the way, the ambient lighting, I just love it. And, I mean, so far I said the Mercedes B-Class is best price performance as Mercedes. Um, overall, from the whole model lineup, this one here belongs to it. I mean, it is somewhat, and no. GLA, uh, the GLA is basically a, a B-Class SUV. This one here kind of also, but just long wheelbase. So you could say long wheelbase B-Class SUV. These Mercedes comp compact models are all relatives. You can also understand that, economies of scales, and they really need to use all the similar parts and so on. Question is, is this one here better price performance now? Well, actually, no, the B-Class still remains price performance king at Mercedes, but this one here just has more, even more space in the interior, has then also the seven-seater 
option and you know available even more upright seating position has the suv driving feeling and of course for some you know they don't like this van image and rather want to go than for an suv like this one here the glp and so what we can definitely say is that it's among the best price performance ratios at mercedes considering <laughs> that's the force activation again what do you think about the glb sister what can i do for you oh she doesn't really get that maybe at some point she will <laughs> yeah can you yeah. say that again please do you love me i like you way more than traffic at least she likes me even more than traffic well i'll take that as a compliment And now to our conclusion for today with the Mercedes GLB, this all new SUV that is between the GLA and the GLC. First of all, exterior wise, more a successor of the GLK or a small GLS because it has a very strong stance. Side profile is maybe not the most beautiful, but then again, it's about the interior practicability. And that's indeed crucial because this one is probably the most versatile Mercedes there is at the moment. So much space on the interior and also considering of the exterior length and next to the B-Class, probably the best price performance Mercedes in the model lineup. It's not that it's cheap, it's just that the other ones are just more expensive for what they deliver in practicability purposes, of course. The interior build quality is also good and full digitalized interior. You have a wide set of animal-friendly seating choices, even though we didn't have the specific one here today. And of course, then you also have the seven-seater option. Fuel economy is not the best. Considering the GLA, it's actually okay, but overall, it should still be better. The engine is good and powerful, but yet again, a little bit too high in the fuel consumption, I think. Yeah, and the car will not be cheap at all, as I said. Then again, cheaper in relation than the other Mercedes model. And that's also what's making it so attractive. So people maybe think about the GLB versus a GLC if you want a better price performance deal. The GLC will still offer you a more sophisticated driving feeling. This one then, however, more spacious open driving feeling and some more off-road character definitely so to me this is now a true successor of the mercedes glk although it's a longer successor now so to say welcome to a full review here of the mercedes glc here on autogefuel your number one resource for in-depth car reviews and your number one community to discuss cars today with thomas and besides our normal review which is already very interesting i hope at least <laughs> we also give you Actually, four more reasons to watch this review today. First of all, this one here is the GLC facelift. That means we'll tell you all about the changes it has here. Second reason is this one is a GLC 300, a very famous, very common petrol engine worldwide. We had the 63 so far in the facelift version, but this one here, of course, you know, a little bit more relevant to even more buyers. Third reason, we will compare it also a little bit to the BMW X3. I drove that one two days ago, a main competitor of this one here. And I tell you, you know, which one is better in, you know, which field here and there. This will be very interesting. And the fourth one, I also recently drove the GLS, GLE, the bigger brother. So let me say it's GLE to this one. And we'll also compare then, you know, if you think about, you know, going this or that one, what are the differences there? So very interesting comparing aspects also in this episode here today mostly i'll comment that during the driving part and also something you know on the interior as well so let's go with everything of that all the information all the fun in full hd full screen and full length let's go Here in the front, we can see the main change with the facelift are those new daytime running lights together with new headlamps, standard now LED, 
optional, the one you can see here, the multi-beam LED for more high beam support. This here in the standard um, line has this dual horizontal fin grille. In the AMG line it would have this diamond pin grille, which would be my favorite as for the exterior design. Pretty interesting design when it's here, however, in chrome looks pretty elegant. Also interesting with those holes there in the lower part. So, but you can definitely change the design around just a little bit. The big Mercedes star is two dimensional because it hides the sensors. And for example, also important, the autonomous emergency brake is standard, but we can also expect that. And also the Distronic, the adaptive cruise control has been updated now with the facelift and there's also a new trailer maneuvering assist. 4 meters 65, 15 foot 3 or 183 inches is the length of the GLC SUV. You know it's also available as a GLC Coupe, which would have the main difference and it has a falling roofline right there. Then wheels start from 17 to 19 inch in the normal GLC specs, which you can see here, the 19 inch ones in the AMG line, there's 19 or 20 inch, so a little bigger, and the GLC 63 even goes up to 21 inch, which is a very massive for this mid-size SUV. Then we also have this optional side step, it's very interesting, Pretty cool design element, even if it's not maybe that practical. And it's pretty cool when it has, like, like it's mirrored in the freshly cleaned paint here in the lower part that looks quite fancy then. Other than that, I like it with the elegant chrome frames around the windows and this typical banded L shape that the GLC has right there, together with some slight strong shoulders of, you know, overall a very elegant design. Well, what's your take on that? In the rear, we can now see a modern tail lamp signature here. This is definitely fancier, so that's the main facelift change. GT3 300 batch. Overall then, I think, you know, not too much screaming out in the rear, rather round design. And the lower end here, this is typical fake exhaust tip. There's nothing in it. So the real exhaust underneath, yeah, dirt, 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 fake exhaust, a and outer fuel. And by the way, suspension information, there's a standard suspension, then a a little bit put higher one for like soft off-road situations for a couple of hundred euros. Same goes for the sport suspension, which goes lower. And then more sophisticated su suspension choices. Adaptive suspension is available for you know a little bit more than a thousand euros extra or dollars. And then more than two thousand extra is then the air suspension, which is also built in this car here today. So there are a couple of other competitors who have that, but not so many. So this is also one of the you know, unique setting points of this car and we'll test that comfort of course later on. Here we go with the engine. Yay! Hydraulic struts. Love that. But I mean, for a vehicle that is between 40 and 80k, we can expect that. So, 2 liter 4 cylinder petrol engines like today also. There's a GLC 200 with around 200 horsepower and a GL3 300 with about 250 horsepower. 255 in US, 258 in Europe, so they're different just a little bit. 6.2 seconds is the acceleration figure. And here in the all-wheel drive today, in the US, it's also available as rear-wheel drive. And new with the face of it is that those two engines, the two liter four-cylinder engines, come with an MHF system, 48 volt board net for more recuperation and also those sailing or coasting functions. Talking about more about that when we drive the car very soon. And Still waiting for the update of the GLC 43. Maybe it's there if you watch the video later on. This one is a 3 liter V6 with 362 horsepower, but that one not facelifted yet at this moment when we record the video. And then already facelifted, also there's a review of that, the GLC 63, the V8 bi-turbo. The 43 also has a bi-turbo, by the way. So the V8 4 liter in the GLC 63 with 476 or on the S version 410 horsepower. And then there are also diesels available, 200D with 163 horsepower, 220D with 194 horsepower and 300D with 245 horsepower. So those ones are diesel then for Europe. And last but not least, there's now also the GLC 300E PHEV, was called 350E before, they changed the name now, so it's a new plug-in hybrid. And Really love to test that one at the later stage. It's a petrol plug-in hybrid that could be a good alternative for a better fuel economy.
Now to the interior, we see here high class Artico leatherette top cover. Then we have a matte wood inlet, which is pretty classic and also sophisticated. Galvanized buttons all over the place. It's a very good build quality and also reasonable door pockets in the lower end. Then today we have a mix of brown and beige for the interior. Yeah, I think that's a matter of taste. <laughs> Here you can see the instruments all digital now, optional with this facelift, soon more to that, but you can see that at the moment it's all shut off. And then those seats here, again today in beige, but the animal skin spec, how do you see that? They have a little bit more elements here, those elements you can see there and count. If it would be the Artico sustainable and animal friendly leather red seat, then it would have, I think, five elements in this back part, so that's how you can visually differentiate them. The Artico seat is really high class and in Europe, especially Germany, you can get also a fabric base seat. Then you can get fabric on the inside and leatherette on the outside, which would be an awesome mix. And then also in the US, you can get a full Artico seat. And the cool thing they offer it in black, beige, gray, brown and red. So Mercedes offers one of the widest choices of different, more sustainable interior materials. Really well done as for the choice. And Dynamica on the inside, microfiber and article on the outside would be for the AMG line. Then you have a little bit sportier and a little bit stickier on the seat when you go into those corners. Phew, yeah, so many things to tell you about the seating choices. You should check out the configurator or the, the you know build, how you call it in the US, and just play around with that a little bit. That's really a lot of fun in this case here also with the GLC. The new steering wheel with the facelift, you can see here left side is for the cruise control now, not a separate column. It's easier to set and also those touch fields. The right button for the right thumb right there. This is then to control the right screen and left thumb, left button for the left screen. This is also new. Now let's get inside, pretty easy entry. You already have an upright SUV seating position, that's cool. Somewhat similar to the BMW X3 as for the height, you know, the overall position and so on. Steering wheel has an electric function here. That's not base, that's an option. So it goes in and out and also up and down quite a lot, actually. Seat control here at the inside of the doors, which is typical, I may say, it's hard to do it while reviewing and while sitting here. Um, if you compare it to the GLE, the GLE bigger, higher, it feels a little bit more open and sophisticated as for that, but just probably know that you have more space. The quality of materials is quite similar in GLC and in GLE. That's different as for the X3 versus X5, where the X5 really has a you know wider span, you know wider um, you know distance to the X3. Definitely very interesting, but feeling very very cozy and comfortable in here. Also because you can put the you know, seating area a little bit um, longer here, and if you have different seat cover, by the way, it won't change necessarily the seat form. There are different seat forms also available, um, but then this one here, the very same, same seat form is also available and with different material. So overall, very good impression at first, and a little bit more sophisticated in general to the pre-facelift because of this new steering wheel and also the screens we have here, and we'll of course turn them on when we have the rear cockpit perspective from behind. So welcome to this interior. Let's turn everything on. You start with analog gauges on the left and optional those full digital 12.3 inch now with the facelift and on the right side you start with a smaller 7 inch screen and optional this 10.25 inch screen and both feature the MBUX, this new voice input system where you can for example say, hey Mercedes, How may I help drive you? me to Berlin. I am starting route guidance to Berlin. So that's really perfect. You can change temperature, turn on and off head-up display, even open and close the sunroof and so on. The best system there is on the market and BMW on uh, Please uh, you proceed know, place to the two at the moment. Route. So um, that, that they're new in the, only in the big cars, not in the X3. Um, so the new BMW natural voice input system, also pretty cool. So that's one thing. Soon more deals to each of those screens. And again here the steering wheel, which is a little bit more you know fancy than before, volume control here on the right side and here with my right thumb I can control the right screen and you can also see how that works but the redundant controls I can also do it like here with a touch or touch screen is of course also one of the new big news and then here in the lower console I can use this touchpad um, that's also an option um, and I can write an address there too this is possible and then with the left thumb I can control stuff here in the digital instruments and also change the styles and so on. So, overall pretty fancy and I think the facelift 
um, you know, did a lot of really nice stuff here, and especially with the wooden decals here, this is like a matte wood here, you can also hear that. Um, that's really cool. And still manual climate unit to be able to control it while driving a little bit better. Um, GPS hotkey, I also like to have it, you know, very well reachable here. And this lower part you slide open and you have a USB-C port now for your smartphone, for the Apple CarPlay and Android Auto connection, but also an inductive charging bed, but it doesn't make any sense if you don't have a um, wireless connection. Some cup holders and last but not least in the middle part here, typically the slides open and then two more USB-C devices underneath with some decent space. And they're going all the way USB-C now, definitely. And now to those digital instruments here. Yeah, we can also <laughs> rev it up then right there. And interesting thing is here, for example, you can you know have the fuel economy then right there. This is our realistic fuel economy at the moment. And then you can also have some GPS input here. If there is the road map, then you also see a more sophisticated stuff in there. Um, you can change this head-up display settings or also the complete design of this one here. For example, to sport your gauges like this and also progressive. And the cool thing is here in the GLC, it loads way faster than in the E-Class or in the GLE with the digital instruments. Probably because it's a little bit easier set up or something. I like it, it's, you know, more progressive. And the head-up display right there, the speed, you can also see the allowed speed and also some GPS information. So it's a very nice option. And the speed itself is the crispest, clearest one of that part. The other parts may be a little bit out of focus from time to time, but overall it's still very helpful. And some more details about this screen. For example, let's take a look at the GPS up close. So it's a nice visualization. Also zoom in and out. And usually also quite responsive. And the Apple CarPlay inter integration looks like this. Does not use all the way of the screen but mostly the CarPlay is also not the widest screen format and this optional Burmese sound system here is delivering a very crystal clear sound, um, awesome. The 3D sound system uh, which is available for the E-Class or the GLE is a little bit better even, but this one here already at a very, very high level. And there you go back to the normal Mercedes model, uh, Mercedes menu. And here, for example, you can also check some engine data. If the engine is then on, you can play around with that. Yeah, here we go with the engine talk. So a lot of things you can set. And what's also very nice is, you know, this comfort features where in this case, you even have option again, a massage, which is very rare for this segment. Of course, again, a cost worthy option. Hmm, that feels pretty nice. It's nice. Yeah, pretty, pretty cool. Um, not exactly that cool as you would have in a GLE where you have like more single dots um, in there um, in the seat, but it's already quite fancy. But you can of course also live without it. And the ambient lighting is also very nice. Except blue, of course, here you can see also something um, you know, of that already in the interior. You can change the color right there. And of course, always brightness all the way up here. Yeah. The rear view camera is quite good as well too, by the way. Also shows you those helping lines, they adapt. And then you also have this drone view from above. But you can also set it to different views here on the right side, like to, you know, all the way rear, for example, or that one here. And I want to show you also another example of this one here, so where the tires are being seen left and right. For example, if you approach a car wash and then you don't want to damage your wheels, then you can really adapt that. Yeah, that's cool, right? And also do the front view camera. So, but that's of course the optional, most sophisticated camera system there is available. And here you can always see that this car has air suspension because with this button you can raise the car for some situations where you need more ground clearance. This one needs a driving mode selector. I will also browse through that when we drive the car later. What I also like is this upper light area because it has this crystal effect, you know, so pretty cool. And that's here where you open the panoramic roof like this and as you see it's split between front and rear and there you can leave some more light in and this is the cover by the way so there would also be a cover available for really really hot days like this and then just press once more like this and here and the cover go through and same habits also for the rear now to the rear also with a nice soft touch article on the inside doors and the matte wood, that's awesome. 
by Mr. Sound System here as well. And yeah, it does exactly fit. You know, those gaps here in the back of the seat, they are really helpful to give you some more knee room. It does exactly fit then for four tall adults. You should always raise the front seat a little bit that it's easy with your, I mean, with your feet underneath. And also headroom wise, although this panoramic roof, it does not go all the way over the vehicle. It's split here in between, but then you have another glass area right there. So leaves a lot of light in and then still some headroom left. And it's actually quite cozy in here. Um, this is of course, and if you compare the former GLK, this one here works very well um, in, the, in the rear. Although it's not the best package, so we have shorter cars and have more legroom, but still you get along very well. And it's also definitely decently comfortable back here. What else do we have? Isofix at the outside parts each. Then you have a cubby hole underneath this armrest or cup holders in the front, which you can fold out. And you can also get a rear climate unit and also two USB-C supplies in the rear. That's also new with the facelift. Here we go. Trunk can also be opened with a foot kick opening mechanism. Then you can actually lock this lower part. That's a pretty cool function. Then we have more storage underneath and that's pretty square dimensions. And I really love this top cover which has rails on the side and it's a very, very clean solution. On the right side to flip the seat and also on the left side together with when you have the air suspension you can also lower the car just a little bit. What I want to do first is give you the measurement to the normal seating area. So this would be here then about 90 centimeters, a little bit more in length. Whereas we have a little bit more than a meter in width, and actually significantly more, almost one meter and ten. And this is really cool, so good dimensions for this trunk. Also in the height here, this is about 40 centimeters to the top cover and to the overall height, this one here is about 75 centimeters. And the cool thing is that when you put a cabin trolley right here in this trunk, it is still possible exactly to close the cover here cleanly above it. And now with the X3, for example, that um, the cover here um, had to go a little bit lower right here in this area. But it also, you know, had the um, additional height for the replacement tires. You should check that out to, you know, just to mention it. And then if we also flip the other part. There's a very cool mechanism here. Usually also an option depending on the market. But then, you know, see everything is easily flowed and all goes all the way flat. And this one here is a little bit less than one meters in 80 in length. So overall, a very versatile car. I like that. Welcome to Thomas's Driving Lounge with the Mercedes GLC in this facelift version. And as I told you initially, I'm going to talk about how does it feel differently from the face from the pre-facelift. How does it feel differently from the BMW X3, one of the main competitors, and also from the Mercedes GLE, the bigger brother, if you're thinking about you know comparing those. And one of the changes here is that those two liter four cylinder petrol engines are now MHEV, so mild hybrid systems. So with a battery that is bigger than a normal car battery, the eco mode, the throttle input is being drawn back and more attention to better fuel economy and so on, earlier shifting up and so and I can see if there's a power output from this MHEV system or if there is this, by the way, the warning system here, the blind spot monitor, and if I set the turning indicator, then I also get an acoustic warning. Pretty good system, and you already experienced that as for the assistance now. So when I'm rolling down here now in the eco mode, what's the car doing? It's recuperating a little bit, but also rolling. So it's more using a rolling. Um, if I go, for example, to, a com to the comfort mode, it doesn't change so much as for the recuperation because it's still rolling. If I go to the sports mode, I have actually more engine brake because the car is, you know, a gear lower. And the interesting thing is, it's charging more. So this is really interesting. I would have, wait a minute, now it's, hmm. But now it's charging more in the eco mode. So not always sure why is it doing that way or that way, because when we were at the beginning of the hill, the car wasn't charging that much. Maybe it's a thing that when the car realized we're going down it for a longer time or so, that then the recuperation set in, sets in. And this is really interesting because, ah, 
now the charging is less again and now we are in the sailing mode this is very interesting so the rpms drop to zero and now we're rolling and the engine is shut off so and this is a thing that is predominantly happening in this eco mode so now we're sailing now to increase the speed once again a little bit more that won't work that well when you are in the distronic in the cruise control mode by the way and I mean that's really interesting because the sailing or coasting thing is something that should be favored by this MHEF system so that's the reason to do that and of course using the recuperation then to get you some electric boost I mean for performance reasons that's one thing and the other thing is also when you are you know getting started just from the traffic light that you can save some fuel by adding this you know electric power to it which was again gained from recuperation earlier so yeah definitely very interesting first impressions the question is always does it make a huge dif huge difference in the fuel economy overall and so far from all our tests we could say if you have a pr proper plug-in hybrid system with a good recuperation then this even made sense for the fuel economy even if you were not recharging all the time but those MHF systems with the smaller batteries on paper they were usually better but then in real life driving tests usually it didn't play such a role for the fuel economy and here as well so well now in winter time but even without using AC we had numbers on, on long term um, long term driving which were actually a little bit worse worse than 9 liters or more kilometers worse than 26 mpg us 31 mpg uk so that's already something good if you reach that but usually the numbers were even a little bit worse that is a little bit worse than we recently had with the bmw x3 with the two liter four cylinder engines so the bmw engine seems to be a little bit more economical in this case but not too big of a difference and again it doesn't seem that this MHF system would play a you know a major role I will check it once again when we're finished with this round definitely on the fuel economy other than that the facelift didn't change much as for the driving characteristics I mentioned earlier that there are different suspensions available base suspension off-road or bad road suspension which sits a little bit higher sport suspension which sits a bit lower and then we've that's just a couple of hundred euros extra each like 300 400 and then if you're going adaptive like a little more than a thousand euros or dollars then you go with the adaptive suspension which is already a nice choice definitely have more variety in the comfort and sportiness and then this one which we have in built here today more than 2000 euros extra is the air body control so this one is the air suspension and quite exclusively also for this segment the Audi Q5 does offer that for example too um, but the BMW X3 for example not well the adaptive suspension of the BMW X3 is really very very good so you're not missing an air suspension and BMW has a very good compromise between sportiness and comfort here so the, the, the compromise is better with the BMW but here the overall comfort is even a little bit better when you have the air suspension so picking the air suspension would be one major argument for going with the Mercedes GLC because you know they have this very soft carpet ride like carpet like right so <laughs> and that's really something very cool you know if you own such a car for 10 years or so then you might think about yeah long-term repair costs on the air suspension that will get very expensive mm, if you're not afraid of that then you know you can go for it and I mean you have enjoyed great comfort until then or if you lease the car then it won't be um, such a problem in any way uh, yeah but this is something really cool you know to be in the, this mid-size SUV here and have such a very comfortable air suspension this is really very very cool it's also pretty silent as for the noise insulation that's also what I like about this car it fits very well the steering is pretty light but still doesn't feel unnatural so everything is transported to the road there's no dead zone of the steering it's pretty cool and with this new infotainment system with the digital instruments in this facelift 
It gives me also a more modern and more sophisticated experience when driving the car. So that's something where the facelift def definitely helped. If you are opting for that stuff, so that's not that it would come uh, directly as standard equipment. Yeah, we know that. That's what Mercedes does. They just want more money from you. That's the downside of you know, those even, even fancier things, definitely. So both BMW X3 and Mercedes GLC, they are really excellent SUVs and definitely among the top in their segment in many, many ways. So again, I conclude BMW best compromise, sportiness and comfort, a lot of driving fun. I would say in the sporty sense, the X3 is a little bit more fun to drive. The GLC, however, top of the, of the, of the comfort, especially suspension-wise, when you pick the optional air suspension here, and then also better in the comfort overall. Um, again, but then it's not that sporty and doesn't, you know, it's not that much fun to drive it. It's still fun, yes, but if you compare it to the X3. And if you then think about, yeah, can it be a little bit sportier with, with the compromise? You know, the GLC 43, for example, which also has the air suspension, but is then set on a very stiff note, that I felt for everyday driving was too harsh. And we actually also got some customer feedbacks who said like, you know, our test drive said like, yeah, I experienced the same thing, Thomas, and therefore I went then, for example, with the GLC 300. Although, you know, someone wanted the 43, you know. So I think um, if you go for the high-end top sports model, you might, want or expect this very harsh and stiff ride but if you're going for those you know semi-performance models i think you want a better compromise for your everyday driving you want a little bit more power but you still want the great comfort this car has to offer and here again i mean it's it's such a pleasure to enjoy this comfort here silence again good noise insulation the engine is very well insulated from the cabin yeah that's that's really something really amazing and is really a very, very tough question if you ask me, GLC or X3, which one would I go for? <laughs> it's really hard, you know, the X3 is a lot of fun to drive. Mm, I really also like the, you know, very central interior they have here, also again with the facelift changes, the voice input system, because here they put the newest one in, in the X3, there's a newer one available for the bigger BMW models. So this one here has the more sophisticated voice input system. And um, whereas X5 with this GLE, meanwhile I have the impression that the X5 is better built as for the interior quality. Here GLC with X3, I have, you know, I think it's the other way around. Um, the GLC somehow has, you know, better build quality to my you know, subjective Im impression than the X3 and um, both you know definitely on a high level but we also know for example where the GLC is being built in, in Germany in, in northern Germany which is you know they're, they're very good as for the quality over the past years um, and the funny thing is like just like one or two weeks ago there was this German TÜV so like you know the, where they do the annual checkups or two year checkups of the cars was this test and the GLC was the winner in the best reliability index quality overall, like not in the segment, yes, also in the segment of course, but overall from all cars being tested. Whereas not, but that's not the case with every Mercedes car, you know. With the GLE, they had some quality um, problems. They changed suppliers now for in in the production for for you know in the, in the US. They brought were brought over to Germany to to fix them actually. So well, there was a hell lot of effort. And so obviously they got new suppliers there now for better quality, but again, the GLC has been proven to be very reliable. If you have been a GLC customer so far, please share your experience. If it's good or bad, please just share your experience that we can either prove the point or maybe there's also something you know, which, which didn't go that well. Would be really looking forward to that. And again, I don't feel like, you know, I need to rush things here. This is very smooth ride again so enjoyable and hmm, yeah those aspects i mentioned i really love the x3 but in this case maybe then it's the glc for me predominantly because i enjoy this very relaxing ride again when i go for the air suspension which i think i would go because that's also one of the unique selling points of this car 
again, very smooth as for the steering wheel, even though it's not the sportiest one. Upright seating position, very comfortable on the long run. And I can, you know, when I want to have the head-up display on, I just say, hey, Mercedes, head-up display on, and then it's already happy, happening, you know? What so, can I do for you? Head-up display on. The head-up display is on. So then it was already on in this case, but I mean, that's pretty cool. Natural voice input and some stuff you don't have to search in the menu and that's already it. So that's also very, very well done. The engine is very silent, very calm, especially when you are in the, you know, in the cruising modes all the time. I mean, the MF changes, yeah, it's nice. You can have some recuperation, but it's not uh, like, a, like a major game changer. We've been running downhill now, um, now quite a lot of time. That, that's why the fuel economy is quite good at the moment. Um, but still, that's you know around nine liters. Although we have been what's happening here? It's an accident. So um, although it was downhill, you know, a lot of times, um, that should be way better now. You know, so fuel economy. Not happy with that. Would have expected more from this MF system. So, um, sports mode, by the way, when I, um, I mean, sports mode, there's no one here at the moment. Let's just accelerate a little bit, see how much power this car has um, for you. So, let's just go. So, that's 70 kilometers an hour already. That went quite quick, and the absolute figure to one kilometers or 62 miles an hour would be 6.2 seconds. So, yes, very silent and refined, this engine, but if you want the power, Wow, you have it. And that felt to me even a little bit more spontaneous than the X3. I have just ridden like yesterday. Yeah, yesterday or like two days ago in the US. Um, maybe in this case, yeah, the, the MF is not that important for the fuel savings, but for the power boost. I mean, this one here has about 250 horsepower, but then, you know, they, they are a little bit more horsepower added by this, um, you know, by this MF system. So, this seems to work actually, you know, with the um, extra electric boost. So, I was expecting predominantly fuel economy changes and not that it would change much in the power, but yeah, it seems that I get the, all the EQ power at the moment now. But actually, it's the other way around. It's a very interesting finding of this driving part. So, it's more obviously about power than about better fuel economy. Pretty interesting, yeah. And we had the same experience also with the Mercedes C-Class, which is sharing a lot of parts here, of course, with the GLC, that's why I also call it C. Um, also, same result with the MF system, that the fuel economy wasn't really that good, but again, for power, why not? And yeah, this Sport Plus mode, you know, really gives you some, some very decent output. Um, pretty nice, definitely. This one here, and um, this car, by the way, also still a classic all-way drive um, system. So, rear wheel bias as well. You also see that, that, for example, the GLC 300 is also available as rear wheel drive only in the US, but only in the US. But that's also you know, always a hint that it's not front plus rear, but rather rear plus front, you know. But this will be a rather classic all wheel drive, the real deal. And in Europe and Germany, you only can get this one here, the GLC, as all wheel drive. So let's maybe go to the normal comfort mode and have some more motorway ride here. And about, let's go to 100 kilometers. Getting on and also setting the cruise control. It's an adaptive cruise control built in here. So I can also set the distance to the car in front of me and then the distance is being kept. So it's pretty reliable. And we also have a lane keeping assist. Do not put your hands off the steering wheel. I'm always ready to intervene. Just demonstration purposes now. Professional rider don't attempt, like, you know, uh, disclaimer. <laughs> so here now the car already complains, I should put something at the steering wheel. But you see the car is being kept in the lane, so that's also done very well. And you should keep your hands on the steering wheel, and then it's a little bit more at ease. So definitely for longer motorway journeys, I can relax a little bit more here in the GLC. and. Probably at this point in this segment, it would be a little bit more important to me than sportiness, but maybe it's the other way around for you. Um, so, pretty cool overall. Then, to me, driving wise, among the top in the segment, if not the best, especially if you think about comfort. 
Then if you think about the GLE, the bigger brother, which I also recently drove, and so I can also very well compare that. Uh, we also had 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour, perfectly silent in this interior. This is also awesome. Good feeling also for the brakes, very natural feeling for the brakes. So how you can, you know, fine tune that. And then again, recuperation is being used. So for the GLE discussion, bigger versus smaller. If you have the air suspension inbuilt in the GLC, it feels like less of a difference because quite often when you compare those midsize against the full size, that's the European definitions for, you know, GLC versus GLE, X3 versus X5, Q5 from the Audi versus Q7, then you feel quite often a very big difference because the bigger ones offer the air suspension and you have more this like smooth carpet ride, whereas those ones here are yeah, not rough, but in comparison, you know, or maybe just off an adaptive suspension, which is already very good, but you feel that as a difference. Mm, this is even out here a little bit, so the riding comfort suspension-wise is almost equal to the GLE. What is different to the GLE is that in the GLE you sit higher, you have a little bit better overview because of sitting higher. On the other hand, the overview is worse when you think about how long and make the car is, you know, and the hood and so on. So here, for example, I can better watch over the hood, although I'm sitting not that high. So it's not entirely black and white, it's, you know, some there, some there. Um, this one here, of course, feels a little bit lighter, a little bit easier to control. You can ease it around the corners a little bit better. And GLE then again gives you a little bit more, you know, huge, sophisticated driving feel. So the question is how much money do you want to spend? How much space do you have in the city when parking? in your garage, in your basement garage, in front of your house or flat or something. So that could be a very crucial point. Um, and you know, because this one here already feels that comfortable. The funny thing is here also that GLC versus GLE, both are excellent cars, but maybe in this case here I would say, I would take the advantages of having a more compact vehicle, a little bit more flexible in the city, and so on in comparison to the bigger GLE. And because they're both set on the comfort, that I feel sportier in this one here. With the BMWs, they are sportier in general. So I don't feel the, you know, the urge to go for the smaller model there, that it's sportier, you know. So the X5 still feels quite sporty for its size. Um, and therefore I don't miss the X3 sporty driving feeling, you know what I mean? Um, and the X5 also has a bigger difference in the interior build quality. Here with the GLC versus GLE, I don't see so big difference in the interior build quality, whereas X3 with X5 is a bigger difference. So to me, between GLC and GLE, I would probably go with the GLC, save some money, be a little bit more flexible in the city. Between X3 and X5, I would rather go probably with the bigger with the X5 because, you know, more elaborate as for the functions, um, better infotainment system, better voice input, um, better build quality on the interior, um, more comfort yet not so much less sportiness. So that's also, you know, very interesting finding, you know, I'm, I'm discovering that myself at the moment as well, you know, so yeah. So it's X5 and GLC. That would be you now my, my decisions then uh, definitely. And yeah, uh, yeah, very interesting also to me for, for that finding. It's always cool to talk about the difference of, um, you know, you know of, of each of those cars. So then told you what is different with the GLC facelift, you know, just minor things driving wise and more the impression you get from those more elaborate things. Then again, general, how it's positioned in this segment and then talked about the difference GLC X3 and also the difference GLC GLE. Hope you really enjoyed this, you know, comparing insight for you today to make the driving path even more interesting. And please leave me your feedback in the comments also about those individual aspects and we'd be really looking forward also, which one would you actually go for, GLC or GLE, GLC or X3? X3 or X5, so let's exchange some opinions um, there in the comment section. We're really looking forward to read that. You know that I'm really trying to read every single comment, although it's like 
couple of hours work per day and 365 year, uh, days, <laughs> yes, 365 days a year. So I'm really spending a lot of my personal time also in, in your comments. Um, just also to give you a feeling that your opinion and you know your experience is really also highly appreciated here. So and then has, let's head over to the final conclusion. And now to our conclusion for the day with the Mercedes GLC here as the facelift. Exterior changes, not that much of course. Yeah, lamps, new LED standard is good. Yeah, the daytime running light, or I'd say like the signature in the tail lamps also look more modern, a little bit cooler. Overall, an elegant design definitely overall for the car. Interior, high build quality and also vast choices of animal friendly material. That is really where they are leading together with Tesla, of course, who made that standard anyway. Also with those infotainment systems, upgrades, this is also pretty fancy. If you go for that one, it's an option, yes, but the MBUX is gladly standard. So with this voice input and so on, this is really leading on the market at the moment. And also some decent space they have there, especially flexible trunk system. That's pretty cool when you have that electric flipping system, especially driving wise, so great, very well insulated. And wow, the air suspension is really so comfortable in this segment, leading in the segment to me as for the comfort. Yeah, maybe the Beam Lever X3, for example, is a bit more sportier fun. But this one here, the Comfort King then as for that. Definitely one of the best cars over in the segment. And I also mentioned that in the driving part, recently at least for a German rating, you know, with the TÜV ratings. So where they check the cars <coughs> on, um, you know, mostly two or three year basis. This one here also scored the best result overall from all cars that have been tested. So it seems also to be a very reliable one. Then also, if you think about the engine, now with the new MHEV system, was a little bit disappointed that the fuel economy wasn't better. So that was actually one of the very few bad results about this review. However, the boost was a little bit better. So I felt that, you know, it was a little bit faster, more explosive as for the excavation with this additional electric boost. So for solving the fuel economy problem, that's maybe where the new PHEV could step in, the 300E, and I hope to test that one also at a later stage. Now I'm also looking forward to your comments and also taught you a little bit more GLC versus GLE. In this case, th this one here, especially with the facelift now, offers so many stuff that GLE is also offering that the difference between GLC and GLE is somewhat diminishing. Of course, there's uh, some differences, also mentioned those, but has been smaller now. This is a full review of the Mercedes GLE, today as GLE 450, today in a German test here, also with the German Autobahn ride, and more about this new suspension feature, e-active body control, we have it also here today. And exterior, interior, and the whole driving experience here on Autogefühl, as you know from us, with Thomas, and everything of that in full HD, full screen, and full length. Let's go! In the front here, the new GLE generation looks a little bit sportier, more agile also with the accentuations here on the hood. This is the standard front grille design with a two horizontal fin layout. The AMG line exterior would have the diamond pin grille. Then the data running light is here still with two stripes. They changed that with the E-Class facelifts, for example, with the sedan and recently also then now with the coupe, but still here the SUV in the GLE gets the two-stripe design. I think more beautiful. Starts with LED and optional the multi-beam LED also with extended high beam function. 4 meters 92, 16 foot 1 or 194 inches is the length of the GLE. There's the bigger brother as GLS also available. Wheel size actually from 18 to 22 inch. These ones here are 21 inch. You can also get the wheel arches in the body color, but this one here, the standard setup with the crossover wheel arches. 
suspension wise very interesting you get a standard seal suspension then you have the optional air suspension as you know and then there's the e-active body control which can actually lean inside the corners very interesting technology and it also has some special off-road functions so actually you can tune every single wheel with the suspension above that where it shall lean in or out that's a very interesting piece if you need it we'll talk about it later in the driving part design wise the GLE has still this one characteristic feature and that is the C pillar that is leaning forward you always recognize the GLE with this design feature the rear has actually been changed most significantly in this new generation with the new horizontal tail lamp design and the signature right there and definitely more modern the lower part by the way these ones here are fake tips but it's not like a hundred percent fake exhaust so yeah i'm not sure if that's a job for the fake exhaust police i think still yes yeah <laughs> so the real exhaust are then on the inside but overall i think a quite likable design here for the gle rather conservative still not too drastic changes i think it works what do you think As for engines, you start with a 2.0-litre 4-cylinder, the 350 with 255 horsepower. That one is available in the US, but not on the European market. Then the 450, today also here, the 3.0-litre 6-cylinder, 367 horsepower. Now with mild hybrid technology, 5.7 second, the acceleration figure. Also available with the off-road package. Then there's the AMG 53, 3.0-litre 6-cylinder, 435 horsepower. Then the 580 is the 4 liter V8 with 589 horsepower and also MF technology now. And then the top horsepower spec, the AMG 63 4 liter V8, 571 or 612 horsepower in the S. And diesels, 300D, 2 liter 4 cylinder, 245 horsepower, 350D, 3 liter 6 cylinder, 272 horsepower, or as 400D, then with 330 horsepower. And then there's the plug-in hybrid, the BF 350DE 2.0-liter 4-cylinder diesel with 320 horsepower system output, 100 kilometers or 60 miles of pure electric range. And we also have a review of that. And then we also expect a petrol plug-in hybrid soon. First, dog clothing sound. Mmm, very solid. And also, when you use the handles here, they even give you a nice sound feedback. And now, interior here with the Artico soft touch leather red cover, seat control inside of the doors with a brushed aluminum look here today, reasonable door pockets. Then, on the interior, we have the AMG line today. That means AMG steering wheel here with this brushed aluminum style otherwise it would be high gloss black so more beautiful than this i think and amg floor mats aluminum pedals and here the sport seats so there are base comfort seats available and these are the sport seats with a little bit more support and amg line auto automatic comes with microfiber dynamic on the inside and article leather red on the outside so this is an animal free choice and also good in the climate comfort in the european market actually my pick would be either this one also or fabric on the inside and leather red on the outside because the gray fabric looks a little bit more contrastish and stays even a little bit cooler in summer but for the us market i would definitely go for this one because the fabric is not available there or if you want some spilling protection have a lot of kits or something then of course a full article seat is also available with a slick surface in black and beige in espresso color so they offer a lot of animal free choices that's really very cool with the GLE and one of the other cool features is the ambient lighting here's one of the key features of that getting inside and yeah shoe tap 
So it's a very nice, comfortable seating position. Again, the sports seat offers you a little bit more support here and very cozy and high class with the microfiber surface. Steering wheel here starts, of course, with a manual control, but in this case here also an electric control for the steering wheel up and down and in and out. And you feel, really find a good seating position. here also as a tall person. Um, if you put the seat all the way down, then there's a lot of headroom still with 1 meters 86 or 6 with 1. I usually put it a little bit up in the back part so the angle is a little bit changed, more comfortable. There's also a panoramic roof available that makes you lose some headroom, but panoramic roofs are also then, you know, fancy for leaving some air in. Here with a microfiber ceiling on the inside, there's also a very cool solution. So one of the most comfortable vehicles here overall, I think, good for longer road trips and so on. I really feel cozy, really feel at home here. So yeah, only positive things I can really see about that. And you don't have to spec it all the way max out fancy. Even with some base GLEs, you'll be just fine. Now to the interior overview, which has a beautiful design, I think. Here with the brushed aluminum look, you're gonna get different decor elements. Then article leather red dashboard, soft touch. It also looks nice with some contrast stitches. Screen setup two times, 12.3 inch, also quite impressive and also has this voice input with, hey Mercedes. Hey Mercedes. How may I help you? Increase the temperature. 16 degrees on the driver's side. So and then also, if you've seen that, when you increase the temperature, then there's like a the red light and you can also use it here with the ambient lighting so when you put it colder it's blue light when you put it warmer then there's red light so really beautifully done cool idea and with the voice input you can say the same Mercedes or then activate it here at the steering wheel and then you can also put some GPS input and so on and even ask them questions sometimes you know like or turning on and off the head-up display that all is working other than that the screens are controlled left thumb here for the digital instruments, zoom out to that, and right thumb here for the middle screen, or using the touch, or the lower touchpad, that works as well. And I think really cool to have this manual climate unit still so good to control it while driving, actually. Well, there's one design flaw or quality flaw I found. The printing of the start-stop engine button looks a little bit weird. Other than that, I think very good build quality in here. This lower area, yeah, a lot of black panel like I hear. The handles are quite cool. Then when you slide this one open, you have your phone connection for the Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. Another USB charger. Inductive charging would also be possible. Then the cup holders are heated and cooled if you pick the option. It's also a very nice one and they're really, really large. Then this touchpad next to that, you have the drive mode selector and a lot of things are coming up here when the driving part begins because you can put it in sports mode, comfort mode, curve mode. This is where the car leans inside. And off-road mode is also very interesting because in the off-road mode here, when you have said that, when the car is on, when it is in the gear and you are in the off-road mode, then you can actually add some other cool stuff and go here to the settings and go to the off-road assist and have this individual wheel control. And then you can actually say, I want to have it lower on the left side and high on the right side. And you also see it on camera how it switches. Um, so really impressive system, especially then for off-road use. Not sure how many people will actually use that other than for showing off. And the free driving mode is the most funny one. And everyone on this parking lot will wonder now because then the car actually moves up and down and you can also start going front or reverse um, to get loose of some, you know, sand situation or something like this. So really cool stuff. Other than that, you can also tune in the air suspension lower or higher here with your, um, you know, separate button. And then there's this armrest, split way opening and more USB C charger. Just to show it once more up close here again, there it is where you can control the individual wheels also in the rear, for example, like this. And then here with the free driving mode, you can pick that. Other than that, it's a really good system. It has a nice overview where to find everything. The Apple CarPlay, um, actually, you can have it here, right there. That's a, such a great song. And there's the integration and the sound. We don't have the top audio system here, 
but this one always has a nice one sound. Well, cool. Wow, really cool. And we experienced that quite a lot of times now with the Mercedes that they have some of the best optional optional sound systems, but even their base sound system or there's often a middle trim sound system, they already do a good job if you don't want to spend too much money. So, and GPS looks like this, also with a nice modern visualization. Oh, look at the small clouds. That's, I think, also well done. And here with the driving modes, again, up close, this is the curved driving mode. And with the curved driving mode, you can also set it to three different levels, how extreme you want to have the car leaning inside the corner. E-Active Body Control is this additional system, but it's really, really expensive. You have to think about it if it makes sense for you. And the rear view camera like this, very good resolution. You also have the drone from above if you have this optional 360 degree view and also the helping lines adapt accordingly. Here we can also pick the exact angle also here to protect your tires left and right or just the front cam and so on. So a lot of different possibilities. Now the digital instruments, you can also put the map in here. You can also have it full screen here with the map. That is possible. So you're really flexible with these digital instruments. They also have a clear display. You can also go to sports gauges, for example, and you can also switch some individual information you want to see left or right, for example, or then again in the middle. Here, for example, you can also switch to left gauge like this, and yeah, you can play around with that pretty lot. And the head-up display with the huge projection, current speed, loud speed, or the direction you're going, and you can also adjust which parts you want to see there. So a very flexible system and again a very, very large projection. It's even larger than it appears here on camera. Rear compartment, also soft touch article at the inside of the rear seat. It's really cool inside the rear seat door. And then what's cool here is you have about the best leg room in this very segment. This has been upgraded with this new generation, a little bit longer wheelbase and I mean, I could sit a little bit more back now if I put, put the steering wheel a little bit more out, but still there's plenty of leg room left. And one of the reasons is that the back bench here is quite short and it falls a little bit backwards. So, I mean, it's still comfortable here, but it's very, very low placed and falls backward. For example, in the BMW X5, I think you sit more comfortable as a rear passenger, also in the Audi Q8 or Audi Q7. Then they're more upright, you sit more like, let's say, like, like this, you know, um, and that's more comfortable, I think, um, but it has then less leg room. So I think it's, you know, it's basically a trade-off. There's also an option available, not equipped with this very vehicle, that you can move the back bench about like, it's like 10 centimeters, four and a half inches, something, front and rear, so you can go for this option. There's also a seven-seater option available, However, I think it also makes more sense for the GLS. Still, comfortable experience. But I think especially when you would have kids, I mean, you have a lot of space to like move child seats in and out, that's good. However, even I, as tall adults, feel a little bit lost in here, you know, like sitting so low. <laughs> Do you see that on camera? Yeah, but then again, the more leg room, that's the thing you gain with that then. I also think that the outside parts each, also with a beautiful microfiber inside, you flip the seats already from here, like this, two-third, one-third split, but you also have the ski hatch available, that you can also flip the one thing, then cup holders here also adaptive for the rear, and you can also get a rear climate unit, if you like, to control everything of that, and also USB-C device, two chargers here for the rear. Oh, and there's even ambient lighting at the rear footwell. So we can open the hatch right there or also with pressing the key. Here we go. So and at the moment I've already removed the top cover and liter figures 8 or 25 to 2055 liters. That's quite impressive. And the interesting thing is here, you can put this top cover here below and this is a very good storage. So, so many times you wonder where to put that thing when you remove it. Here they found actually an interesting possibility. And you can of course install it right there. Here we go. There's also seven seater option available, told you earlier, but not in this case then. And you can see you have a very good square area. And now some measurements. 
So the width here is actually more than a meter. So more than a meter in width, that's quite good. Length, normal length of a trunk is also a little bit more than a meter. The height here up to the cover approximately would be about 40 centimeter and the overall height here on the top part is about 80 centimeters. To flip the seats, we either have to go around, but here when the cover is not mounted, then we can actually also do that from here with a little help like this. And you can also, if you have the option, move the bench a little bit forward, that would be possible. But here, yeah, a little bit under two meters then to the front seat as I would be driving. That's also pretty cool. And the last, last visual impression, I can also put some luggage in here that you can see how the dimensions you can also refer to. And if you have the air suspension, you can also lower the vehicle here a little bit for loading. And the child safety test, how does that one look like? Whoa, whoa. Yeah, a little bit stronger than usual from a Mercedes hatch here. Uh, strange. Let's test it again. Here we go. That's what I was expecting, but still the first one was also not too harsh. So usually Mercedes got it quite right here with the torque. Second time worked even better. Welcome to Thomas's driving lounge with the Mercedes GLE, GLE 450 here with the inline six cylinder now as MHF mild hybrid system and we're going to do some city driving we are going to head on to the motorway and we first start with the slower speeds and then we'll also floor it out max speed really high speed check noise installation and so on and so different aspects coming up here interesting here you can see the camera side here on the center display and this actually always happens you can turn off and on that function when you're approaching the next traffic light. And I mean, here in the GLE, it's not that critical because the windscreen is quite high. But for example, in the CLA, um, that was very relevant, this function, it is meant to be a traffic light visibility. So sometimes, you know, traffic lights are placed way low and then you have to like, where is it? I can't see it. And that way you can just sit like this, all good. Then you can see the traffic light jumping to green here on the screen. Yeah, it's some kind of pre decadent function, but you know, again, for vehicles that have very low windscreens, that might make sense. Why not? Very interesting. So we have 21 inch wheels mounted here, so rather bigger ones that, of course, reduce the comfort a little bit. Um, you feel it in some smaller bumps on the road, so if you want more comfort, then go for smaller wheels. However, there is the air suspension mounted in here, and that is still set on a soft node, which is pretty cool. like it when air suspensions are still set on a soft node, and that is the case for the Mercedes non-AMG models. If you pick an AMG model with air suspension, then they make it that stiff that you can't really feel it's an air suspension anymore. But to me, the GLE, one of the best comfort rides overall, actually. So one of the most comfortable cars to me. And again, with the combination with the Dynamica Artico seat, also keeping me cool in summer and warm in winter. It's a very good choice. And the seat form itself, here also from the sport seats, is still very comfortable and you have a little bit more side support in this case. The car is also extremely silent, very well insulated. We'll soon experience that, how it looks like when we are at really higher speeds. The steering is actually rather soft and not too direct. It does not have any dead angle, that's good. Gives you a good feeling. However, Mercedes has the philosophy of not making them too progressive. So you have calmer running straight, and then in corners you have to steer a little bit more, but that's just a matter of preference then. Seeing here, told you earlier, the AMG steering wheel here with the, you know, sportier style and the, let's say, brushed aluminum look right here. AMG line also because of the seats. Interior, didn't have it on exterior. So, different suspension modes we have also for the air suspension. So when we go, for example, to the sports mode, suspension gets stiffer and, I'm not sure, maybe if you are also here, hear that, the gears are turned up higher in this case also. So um, we can experience that on the motorway, the three and for sport here driving, this three liter inline six cylinder, 
does give you quite some good performance definitely told you the figures earlier and also has actually a decent sound still and with this new MF technology on the left gauge you can see EQ charge so at the moment I'm going downhill the car is recuperating so gaining maximum energy and then when I accelerate it is used both for better fuel economy and for an additional boost when you really floor out the car so and so far the experience was that it does actually make sense in this case we had some engines where there again the traffic and well in this case it does make sense here so at the moment the traffic light stands in a way that here the back mirror and you know the plate above that everything is blocking that so i could not i would need to do like like this and that way i can just like hey i'm in my gle you know <laughs> you can just look at the camera light yeah learning to appreciate this function <laughs> yeah why not modern times right so uh, yeah back to the mf system in this case here for this engine it really seems to make sense because okay when you drive at high speed it will consume a lot of fuel anyway um, then you can also score some 12 liters or more kilometers that's no wonder then the mf system also doesn't help but especially here in city driving oh look at that you see the white vehicle uh, sl coupe that was blocked by the white fiat 500 not sure if you could see it in the small camera what a beautiful vehicle yeah, always laughing on the auto fuel. Sorry, I'm always looking out for different car models. You know, the car enthusiasts you do that and say, "Oh, look this guy! Oh, oh, oh! I've been driving this one ten years ago." And I, like something like this. <laughs> so the MF here, especially here in city traffic, stop and go, it really works and can get us actually down to about nine to ten liters on one kilometers, which is excellent for a vehicle of this size and this size of engine, which would be about like. 25 26 mpg us even some 30s mpg uk that's of course pretty cool just when you floor it out then as i said more than 10 liters or more kilometers that would be rather than like some you know 23 mpg us and 26 mpg uk and when you floor it out so but you have the possibility to drive this car here in a reasonable economic way and again if you if you're gentle with the vehicle, you can score equal consumption figures here with the 3-liter 6-cylinder, like with the 2-liter 4-cylinder. That shows again, downsizing is just using on paper. It's not making sense for the environment, you know, in a practical, effective way. At least it's for 6-cylinders. The 8-cylinders, however, they consume way more fuel than the 6-cylinders. So, to me, from my experience, the 3 liter 6 cylinders, also different brands, seem to be the best engines, consumption wise, power wise. You know, you just run them at lower RPMs. That also makes sense and also good for long term durability. Now I'm switching to the sports mode and do some first acceleration from 50 to 80. Plop, that's it already. But that was a little bit. You realize that? A little like stuttering in acceleration. Hmm, that was strange. I haven't experienced that so far. Um, I mean, it wasn't really the engine, it was rather the shifting that was a little bit, seemed a little bit confused, wasn't it? We test it again when we flow it out in a max way, once again, very soon. Now, the first motorway test, 80 kilometers an hour so far. Cruise control you set here on the left side of the steering wheel. There's also the adaptive cruise control built in here. And also this maxed out with the assistance systems. So we also have the active lane keeping assist. And we'll see. Um, it tells me that it actually works. It depends on sometimes here in the yellow construction side markers, the systems work sometimes not of course i'm you know really cautious here doing doing these tests here but so far so i'm not steering at the moment now it's telling me i need to move the steering wheel not capacitive yet so it has a movement sensor no not not a touch sensor but here keeping me in the lane in the construction lane here and i mean it's a very narrow lane for this not so small car 
Wow, that's well done. Awesome. Cool. So that's really cool. I mean, those tricky situations are then, in a way, always good to test them right here as well. There's also a blind spot monitor built in the side mirrors. So, triangle, small triangle. Let's see if we can use it very soon when vehicles are overtaking us. So, I'm always picking in the left lane here because you can drive 80 here and 60 on the other lane. And then he there. There, it's going to 80. <laughs> a little bit faster on this lane here. Pretty funny. So, assistance systems wise, good impression so far. Um, also, autonomous emergency brake is standard anyway, and then the upgrade assistance systems you can get into you now into another pack, optional package. Different driving modes, by the way. Here again on the motorway, I would rather set it to the comfort mode to have that with this floating air suspension style. And here, when the road is even, the 21-inch wheels also are no problem. Just when some bumps are appearing, then you feel the the size of the wheels. Other than that, I really love that air suspension that is built in here. Such an awesome ride. So what's that here? Not sure. But that's uh, giving us a good possibility to test the blind spot monitor, which should appear right now. Yeah, there it is, red triangle. And when I set the turning indicator, it should change something, but it doesn't. Hmm. Well, in this case, just red triangle appearing. Sometimes it's, it's the case that when I set the turning indicator, there's like an additional warning, but I wonder why isn't that the case in this, this case. I'm not sure if you can deactivate it in the menu or something, but here in this case, just a red triangle. Anyways, here the adaptive cruise control, setting it now to 100 kilometers an hour. Again, such a perfect silent ride, awesome, really comfortable on the motorway, now keeping the distance of the car in front of me. And another very interesting mode is we not only have the air suspension here, we also have the e-active body control, which is enabling us with this curve mode. And in this curve mode, the car is evening out the G-force by leaning into the corner like a motorcycle. And so when I go here now, the car is upright still. So this is, so to say, Mercedes way to not use an anti-roll control but use this one here, this diving into the corner with that, and it's, it's really, really funny. So um, it's a very unique driving experience. We'll soon head on to the motorway again. I just want to give you more acceleration. Yeah, there again, the camera picture. And when we are you know, on, on rolling onto the motorway, I can do some left, right, and then maybe you can see, it's really hard to see on camera. It's more like you experience that yourself, um, but it's really like when you are in this slalom, the car keeps really upright and doesn't lean to left and right. And that's part then again of this curve system that the car is evening out the G-forces. Really amazing. But here we go to the Sports Plus mode now and really hammer it out. Let's see about the acceleration of this engine and also then about high-speed noise insulation. 30 kilometers an hour, let's go. That's 200 kilometers an hour, or 125 miles per hour. Very decent acceleration. All-wheel drive has a rear-wheel bias, and now, even here, pretty stable at high speeds. You can also put the curve mode here now at higher speeds, see how that one plays out. Interesting. So, in the sports mode, the suspension is stiffer. That helps us to keep the car straight, but in the curve mode, it's also helping. So, but it's a different feeling, and steering feeling is a little bit loose in the curve mode in um, comparison to the sports mode. In the sports mode you have a stronger um, steering feeling. On the brakes now can very well, you know, very well feel the brakes, good to tune. Uh, however you feel the weight of the car, I mean, it's a big SUV so that's no wonder then. Also more decent sound in the sports plus mode from the exhaust and I think again that this six cylinder is a very good compromise. You know, it's not too much over the top like the eight cylinder. Still, you can drive it in a reasonable economic way. So, 
I think that's the, the engine to go for, definitely. And, as I told you earlier, in city driving, it also makes sense, sense consumption-wise because you can use this recuperation and so on. You know, in the tunnel, you can see more of the ambient lighting, once again, right there. That's beautiful, so beautifully done. So I always enjoy night riding in these vehicles, definitely here with the ambient lighting and there, and also here in this area. Really, really cool. I'll see again when I hit the throttle. First, the EQ power is being used because there was some energy left. So when you're rolling or just accelerating a little bit, again, you get this help. And this also explains why the consumption can be put down. Of course, after like a big acceleration like this now, it has looked different, but you know, that's also no wonder. So when we get off the motorway now, I'll um, show the curve mode once again. The interesting thing is you can set it actually how extreme it shall react. So one, two, three, so three levels overall you can set for that. And level one would just be you know, like that you hardly feel it. Level two would be then a little bit more. Let's see, we go to the curve mode. So again, show the actual the difference. So level one again, um, this is just slightly, you don't see it. You feel it a little bit, but you can't see what the car is doing. In level two here now, um, it feels more extreme, so to say, and more unique. And you already see it with your own eyes that the car is leaning a little bit into the corners. And level three then is even more. And this is really a very peculiar driving feeling because yeah, it's really hard to describe, you know. So when you're going like some left and right, you can almost shake up the car yourself, but not in the usual way. You know, usually when you do like fast left, right, it would be like the car like But in this case, it's that the car is like doing these movements, you know, especially with the, the, the front, especially dips a little bit in. So it's like the, you know, like the opposite side. So it's a very funny, unique driving experience, especially if you set it to lean level three, and I mean, it, <laughs> I have a little bit mixed feelings about it because the driving feeling is so unnatural and unlike everything you know. Then again, you can also argue for it that the g forces are being like covered for you and especially then for the passengers. Since, you know, as a driver, you can always hold onto the steering wheel, but the other passengers can't. Um, I'll soon turn on turn left and then see if I can also do it a little bit fast and may, maybe you can even pick that up on camera how the car is leaning then in, inside the corner and to me as a motorcycle driver I um, always like some motorcycle uh, quotes or so, <laughs> so to say when, when cars do that so now we have some nice corners up ahead and now we're at the level three and doing some left and right this is so funny <laughs> yeah, when the car dips in on the other side and when you are in the corner actually, then usually the car would go to the outside, but you've maybe seen it, it really keeps all the way straight, you know, because then there's again this, this one force against the other force and use the force, young Padawan. And there's really a lot of fun. So especially when you are in agile driving situations in the countryside, then it's it's really a lot of fun. Again, not a natural driving experience, but something unique and fun. If you want to spend the extra money on it. Uh, you know, there was also like this music um, performance from the GLE, like with the like lowrider style, which you can theoretically program if you hack into the system, what the engineers did for fun. So this suspension can do a lot, but do you really need it? Hmm. I think for this extra price, now it's super expensive to opt for it. In my opinion, you're just fine with the normal air suspension with this vehicle and just enjoy it. And so e-active body, e body control, I think nice tech gadget, but not really necessary. There would be one use case that is, um, you know, when you are in, in an off-road situation and then you use this, you know, 
like up and down feature to really get out of loose sand that would be possible and you can really do that your own on your own here in the, in the vehicle but to me that would be the only real use case so 100 kilometers an hour sports plus mode and let's see when we're already at speeds here now what about the acceleration now already shifted down the gear and let's go Well, that's 200 once again, 200 kilometers or 125 miles now, and once again the noise installation, I mean, we are in an SUV. This is like a driving cupboard, <laughs> and it's still reasonably silent here. This wouldn't be a typical speed, of course. Um, let's go back to the comfort mode and go to a rather typical speed, which would be, for example, let's say 130 kilometers an hour, which is a reasonable motorway speed. And here at 130 kilometers an hour, super silent very decent ride i love that so definitely still one of my favorite suvs also especially one of my favorite cars overall as for the comfort suspension and seating wise and so on once again really enjoying it and would be one of my first picks actually if i think about doing longer trips like a holiday trip a road trip and so on so and Let's keep it up here now. Seeing once more on the curve mode. Yeah, it's re really so funny to drive this curve mode. The car feels way different in the indeed, you know, more like a motorcycle, <laughs> more or less. If you can talk about that when driving an SUV. Um, yeah, but again, I think it's not a must have. It's when you have some money to spare and yeah, I just want something very interesting technology-wise. Here yeah, at some lane changes, you maybe feel that. Um, sometimes it's feeling also a little bit aggressive, you know? Only when you, you know, turn the steering wheel a little bit more. It just feels a little bit sportier than overall. For the co-driver, it can actually make sense even more because as a driver, you always hold onto the steering wheel and even all the G-forces by that somewhat co-driver does not hold onto the steering wheel so this curve mode could especially serve the co-driver but that the air suspension is shaking up everything you know that would to me be just enough and then you're also not changing the driving modes <laughs> all the time all over again so yeah now again a little bit more silent driving 80 kilometers an hour also the visibility in this vehicle is awesome so right windows all around the vehicle also the rear so although it's not a small vehicle I have great visibility I really exactly know what's going on around me and also the visibility of the head-up display is great you know it has this zoom function or like standard setup that's really huge in your line of sight so yeah it's really hard to find something negative with this car you know there was this story that they had a wrong supplier or wrong suppliers. Um, they're built in the you know in the US here. The the GLE and the GLS and they have obviously made some bad contracts with bad suppliers and then they had pr um, quality problems. And all the GLE and GLS they were sent to Germany then to be retrofitted with you know better tech and they were kind of yeah let's say repaired. Um, before they, uh, most vehicles before they actually went to the customer, then they decided to um, fire some people in um, in the management um, and then change the suppliers. And they say now everything is fine, you know. But yeah, stuff happens, and especially when they're searching for cost savings. You know, and manufacturers nowadays their margin is slipping away. They're searching for cost savings, then maybe pick um, cheaper suppliers. Um, yeah, but you see that can also fire backwards. If they do some stuff like that, and obviously they went back now to a little bit more expensive suppliers, less margin, but then again, better quality for the customer. And you know, after all the test cars we have done here, if I compare them, the US built cars with the German built cars, I couldn't really tell, you know. So um, when they have the right suppliers in place and the same um, you know, quality management systems, 
I wouldn't really see anything where I could say, oh, this is now like a US build or something, you know. The particle filters, that is different, you know. So this is also maybe one of the reasons, um, I'm not sure if, if the first engine we tested was already with MHEF at that point, I'm not sure. I think not, but didn't have a particle filter. And when they don't have the particle filters, they also consume less. And again, particle filters are of course good for our breathing. Yeah, it's always a trade-off, definitely. So very interesting driving impressions here once again from the GLE. And yeah, probably here the GLE 450 and also with this interior setup here with the seats. Unless you are in Europe and can also pick the fabric um, article mix, which is like the fabric stays even a little bit cooler here than the Dynamica. This configuration we have here today, probably one of the GLEs then to go for. What do you think? Now to the conclusion for today with the Mercedes GLE. Still one of my favorite big or full-size SUVs because it does give you this air suspension carpet ride driving feeling, very comfortable in the seating position, very good in the seating choices for the sustainable animal free options and also especially if we pick a little bit you know a smaller wheels than we have here today the overall comfort it delivers you. Nice styling, not too much over the top, quite sensual. Here in this new generation a little bit sportier in the design. The interior with a nice build quality and also especially very cool ambient lighting. That's one of the features I like best actually with this vehicle. Nice voice input you have there, actually the best on the market at the moment. And the offering of space is also quite good. Seven seater option is available as I said earlier. Doesn't make too much sense. I think then you would rather go with the GLS to really make you know use of it, out of it. E-Active body control, yeah. I mean, it's a very interesting tech gadget, but also not really necessary. I would just pick it with a basic air suspension, maybe like 19 inch wheels or something, and you have the best comfort setup. And AMG Lani on the interior is a very nice option, especially with this microfiber seat stand here. So overall, I think one of the best SUVs in this segment here at the moment. The BMW X5 is a little bit more fun to drive. This one here then rather the emphasis on the comfort. So it's up to you then which you find best. After our initial test in the US, today we're going to take the Mercedes GLS in this new generation out to German roads. Also with the high speed test and telling you V8 or inline six cylinder, what's the most suitable engine for this vehicle. And as you know, all in exterior, interior, and that driving experience with Thomas here for you reporting on the GLS. Enjoy everything in full HD, full screen, and full length. Let's go. In the front, the new GLS generation, you can see here a very strong front grille. Yeah, really massive indeed. Horizontal fins then here. And lower part, it looks like it would be all air intake, but it's not. It's closed here in the lower area. LED multi-beam is standard, so also with the special high beam function then. So for the GLE, it would be an option. Here it's already standard. Then you see one daytime running light right there and a silver color for today, a typical Mercedes color for sure. So this new GLS generation is two centimeters wider, but also 7.7 .7 centimeters or three inches longer. Now at five meters 20 or 205 inches and wheels come from 19 inch to 23 inch. So a 21 inch wheel as we have right now, is a good compromise. <laughs> yeah, the size of wheels have just gone nuts recently. And I can really say together with the air suspension, which is standard, the 21 inch wheels also work indeed. Option, you can also get the e-active body control that can then lean inside the corners, approximately like a motorcycle. And also you can move individual wheels or we also have an off-road demonstration in our other review of that one. Very interesting. So if you're interested in more off-road or the US from the, the review from the US, 
you can also tune into that. We have it also on our channel and we will also link it in the video description. Other than that, of course today the focus on road driving and German mo uh, motorway and the Autobahn and so on. Typical design element of the GLS is also here, you know, this rear window then here with the shoulder element and you have the design that ends then down there and crossover wheel arches still to keep this SUV look that would be different than with the AMG model for example which will be based on approximately the same engine not quite the one but here already with a lot of horsepower soon more to that in the rear we can see the most drastic design change here for this new generation more horizontally drawn tail lamps and this looks definitely more modern and also in line with smaller SUVs at Mercedes for example the lower part <whistles> out of fuel fake exhaust police because the real ones are on the inside Under the hood, there's either the GLS 450, 3 liter inline six cylinder, 367 horsepower, or the GLS 580 here today, 4 liter V8 twin turbo, 489 horsepower, 700 newton meters of torque. We'll talk about differences later. All wheel drive with the rear wheel bias, and all petrol engines are now mild hybrid. Very interesting. And diesel side in Europe would be 350D or the 400D, both 3 liter inline 6 cylinder, 1286 or 330 horsepower. This is the car key, pretty elegant and also light. Key is entry, put your hand on the outside or on the inside and the door closing sound. Let's listen to that. Very solid. And what we also have here is the soft closing feature, magic. Beautifully at the inside of the doors, mad wood really nice and then the seat controls and here the matte wood with the sunlight on it that looks really amazing article cover here at the inside of the doors high grade leatherette reasonable door pockets then this interior with the dual screen setup soon more about the infotainment steering wheel left side for the cruise control right side for volume then you have these buttons also for the thumbs to control the left or the right screen here Seating setup, different colors are available. In the GLS 450, you can pick the Artico high grade leatherette, animal free, in black, beige, or brown. This will also be way to go for the GLS. And sadly, the V8 is not offered with that. And also in Europe, they made a drawback with the Artico now. So that's a big difference also with the GLE, where you can get more seating alternatives which are more sustainable, not anymore for the GLS. But most customers will go for the GLS 450 and the Artico seats, so it's still somewhat okay. Now let's get inside, also with the shoe tap. And remember when I talk about Artico seats in Europe, the brand name for the US is usually then MB Tex. Here, sitting upright, great seating position, so really very comfortable, so you can yeah just enjoy that all the time. 1 meters 86 or 6 foot 1, still enough headroom. This is equipped with the small glass roof right there well small nothing with this vehicle it's really small but i mean they have some bigger panoramic roofs um, also for these kinds of vehicles definitely but still leave some nice light inside and you can also drive with that quite fast so like 100 kilometers or 60 miles an hour is actually possible also then without like too much wind turbulences steering wheel up and down in and out electric function and also electric control for the seats here at the inside of the doors so doing that while reviewing is always a little bit unpractical or impractical but you know you get the idea definitely and here you are of course king of the road welcome to this interior with a very central setup and 12.3 inch two times these screens form one unit and then matte wood right here you also have this matte wood area right here really like that very central setup can you know cannot serve enough here it becomes red when you 
put it on the warmer blue on a colder temperature. The ambient light, you can also see it while we are on the motorway in the tunnel. This will be very interesting for sure. Then the steering wheel again with the good compact size. Soon more deals to each of these screens. Then in the low part, you can slide this one open, have the USB connections two times to the smartphone, also inductive charging, but Apple CarPlay and Android Auto work via cable anyway. Cup holders here. They're adaptive and also cooled or heated on demand. That's a nice functionality. Not new, but still good to have it. Then you have this touchpad where you can also control the infotainment system. Or you do that with your right thumb on the right or left thumb for the left screen. You have also hotkeys and then you can stiffen up the suspension or also put the air suspension higher or lower on demand. But that's also connected to the driving modes. And then you have this middle armrest you can open it like this and then you have the USB-C connectors right there and some cubby hole um, there is this um, you know heating for example for the armrest but uh, on the left side for left arm it works well but then here this here you know where the handles are this is a hard pack area and this is where your elbow would be but the soft area begins behind your elbow so I didn't know what I thought about that um, also makes no sense to heat the area behind the elbow then hmm. The digital instruments look like this, actually quite nice as for the resolution and also for the overview. You can change also the individual contents left and right and so on. And then you also can change the whole styling if you like. So for example here we go to some sports gauges, so depending on you know, which styling you like best. And for the middle part, probably the most useful thing is then also the GPS view like this either directions or the whole map or then the map all over the place. And then we have the head-up display which is really extremely huge so on camera it's rather deceiving because in for real life it's you know for your human eye it's even bigger in the speed current speed uh, loud speed and also the GPS information right there in your line of sight. Then more deals to the infotainment system, either controlled with a lower touchpad, with the right thumb touchpad, or then here with touch on the inside. That's of course the biggest news. GPS looks like this is yeah quite responsive enough. Here the BMW uh, GPS system also is a little bit more responsive. Hey Mercedes, drive me to Berlin. So GPS input would be also the most usable function here for the new MBOX system. But you can also, of course, do more things with that. How long it takes, it really depends on the web connection. The better the web connection is, the faster it will actually go. Then the new main menu right here is actually quite nice. Maybe if you have the optional massage seats, you can hear hot relaxing back shoulder, activating massage, activated also in high intensity for driver and for the passenger and depending on like you know where you come from or where you hover it around then you usually the car also realizes like which seat you want to activate at first ambient lighting here of course always full color blue and the brightness all the way up again you can very well see that here in our um, you know tunnel part in the driving review then and the other apple carplay here it's like the integrations here there comes some you know some space left right there and the Burmester sound system, the optional one, yeah, it's really nice, quite clear, so also one more luxury feature. And the camera system, once again a highlight, really cool with the fake drone view from above and also with the normal rear view and then it adapts accordingly and also has this autonomous parking in and out function. And by the way, when you have a root set, you will see some augmented reality functions then um, in the camera screen here it will show like arrows uh, where to get out, out of a roundabout and so on we also have some live demo testing from that in our um, you know us testing review um, you know in the driving part there you could see it very well and now to this rear seating area and what i've done is the following here in this seat here i pulled it all the way backwards also controls at the inside of the doors like it is in the front um, these are here the individual captain seats you can also get a bench that goes all the way through in the US. This setup here, the six-seater setup with captain seats is standard. And you pick the seven-seater, the bench. And in Europe, for example, the bench is standard, also in Germany. And then you pick the six-seater as an option. Yeah, interesting. You can also control it here, for example, put it a little bit more in the back, this, you know, um, you know 
the background of the seat, but here it leans a little bit backwards, so it doesn't feel so much as an individual captain seat. So if you compare the BMW X7, for example, there they have the philosophy, they put very individual, more upright captain seats for more luxury comfort, yet at the same time you cannot fold them. These have the advantage that you can still fold them. So this is more like, it feels like the outside of a bench, just the middle is left, you know, and this has then advantages and disadvantages. So, I mean, you have a lot of space, a lot of room right here, but I honestly feel that the comfort of these back seats is not ideal, not the best. Hmm. So, I mean, speaking about the high level of comfort and level, of course, you still have a lot of space to move around. But I think just from, um, you know, seating ergonomics wise, um, yeah, I'm not sure. I can't really say I'm happiest with that one, considering the space and the price of the vehicle. Legroom here, which is really a lot. Headroom, also no problem at all. And in the middle part, we have a separate climate unit. And in the lower part here, there's another cubby hole with two USB-C chargers. And then here, the other side, I've set to position where I can still sit with one means 86 or six with one. So here, put it also to the back a little bit. So I can still sit here. And then I want to know, what about the space behind me now in the third seating row? And now I fold this seat down that you can actually see what I'm doing. And the cool thing, the kids will always enjoy that, that you can just clinch through the middle tunnel here. Yeah, when you're not a kid anymore, there's not too much space. But anyway, this is possible behind the seat as it would be all the way back. There's no space for me anymore. But this would be the seat when it's drawn all the way forward. And then I can squeeze myself behind it. Also have to put the head restraints up here that I can probably fit in there. And this is, yeah, really close. So not too much space left here. You see the, you know, the packaging is not the best. If I think about the Mercedes GLB, I probably would say I maybe even have more space here in the rear seat in the GLB, in that small SUV, than here. Hmm. So. I mean, it does work somehow, especially now when I have the tunnel here, I could put my leg right here or something. Um, but indeed, you know, otherwise there wouldn't be, you know, need to be someone smaller here in the front of me or so. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Isofix, by the way, at the rear seats here, so you can also use the last seating row then, for example, for child seats, that's possible, and USB-C chargers on both sides. Oh yeah, and headroom-wise, this is actually then no problem. Trunk area, maximum of 2,400 liters or 83 cubic feet if you fold everything. Here you can even put this cabin trolley in an upright way inside. So this is then the trunk when all the seats are up. And as for the measurements, looking here the length then, that to the middle part here, there's about 53 centimeters and to the side part 56. Here the width, this is a meter, you know, classic. And you see it's wider than the meter right here and 6th and 7th seat or 5th and 6th seat depending on the setup then you can fold them electrically and you know it takes some time but it is really a very comfortable solution like this this is then the you know the last row and then you really have already a very very long trunk and everything also very good from the build quality this is a length of 1 meters 25 and this on the right side here for this one on the other side you can press these two in and these are the captain seats and this is the big advantage if you compare the BMW X7 for example. These individual captain seats, they are not that elaborated as in the X7. As for their setup, they are more like normal bench alike with the middle left out but then they can be folded. This is a big, big advantage and probably also a reason to not go to go for the captain seats in the X7. Here, and this is in two meters in this longer, more than more than two meters, what you have then here as the absolute loading length. So a lot of space you have here. And with this captain seat setup, I think probably the best setup, you can fold it, you are flexible, but still have something more individual in the normal rear. Welcome to Thomas's driving lounge with the Mercedes GLS. And I promised you to take it on the German motorway because we tested first time in Huta in the US and it was an amazing ride definitely and what a beautiful landscape. Not the desert Utah, but more like you know the Salt Lake close Utah. And here we have the possibility to floor it out 
whereas in the US we could test other things. From 50 kilometers an hour, flying start, let's go. That's 200 kilometers an hour or 125 miles per hour. Yeah, switching a lane is not a good idea then when such a GLS tank is approaching. And wow, that was amazing power of that V8 engine. Whee. Okay, that's where you feel the difference V8 and the inline six. But you've also seen in the other video we have from the inline six cylinder. It also has a decent performance, definitely. Here, of course, even more, you know, better V8 sound. What is interesting, when we put it to this curve mode of the E-Active e Body Control and do lane change, the car really remains upright. And for such a heavy SUV with the air suspension, really unusual, but interesting then in this driving characteristic. So when we put it to the comfort mode, then you would definitely see yeah, it leans a little bit more, you know, like shakes a little bit up more. But still, even in the comfort mode, it remains relatively upright. At the same time, you have really good comfort. So I think they found a good suspension setup here. The curve mode is not really necessary and it's also an additional extra. So I think you can save the money right there. With the GLE, it makes more difference. It really makes the car lean inside the corner. But once again, I feel normal air suspension, leave it like it is, don't add, add extra any more complexity to it. The E-Active body control has, you know, like this special feature that you can move individual wheels and so on for off-road situations um, or like this, you know, shaking free in the sand. But usually most of the time you don't really need it. Nice ambient lighting here also while driving. You can see it from the perspectives all the way around the vehicle. One of the best ambient lightings at the moment under the screen and also then here in the central way, putting it warmer, then you see it turns to red, putting it colder, it turns to blue anyway. But yeah, I've set it always to blue, of course, Thomas Blue. And then yeah, this is a really nice feature they added here. So sometimes, and then you, when you, for example, activate the seat massage, let's go here to the comfort settings and then at hot relaxing back, hot relaxing shoulder, activating massage, like classic massage activating massage maybe they don't fall asleep and uh, you think just hmm, why don't I just keep driving you know like wherever just keep driving with no destination or something so that's to me the cool thing about this vehicle it brings so much riding comfort and you don't have to think about you know what's like next what's tomorrow and Relax a little bit while enjoying this seat massage, which is really a good function here. So some seat massage you can say like, yeah, whatever, they don't do that much, but it's really cool with the different programs as well. And also when it's cold and put it like either to the direct program with hot relaxing back or shoulder or activate the seat, uh, the seat heating here directly at the inside of the doors, which is also, you know, uh, very well placed as for the button. Here we're being in the corner, normal comfort mode, also easy steering of that vehicle. So it's really one of the vehicles at that size that is the easiest to ease around. So even if you're not experienced with driving big vehicles, it's so easy to drive this vehicle. That's really cool. Camera systems, of course, as well. But then again, you have to take the length, the overall length into account. And for European roads, it's sometimes tough. You'll, um, you know, I'll also talk about that when I drive this car in like in city traffic and so on. Um, but overall, yeah, what a monster performance wise, especially with the V8. I can already tell you the inline six cylinder is also quite good in performance and it's right sized for this vehicle, I think. At the same time, one of the kings of comfort, no doubt. And one more time, well, I still enjoy the activating massage come with the sport and do sport plus mode rpms are turned up higher gears are already lower and when we are already at speed one kilometers an hour let's put this rolling activating massage once again to speed let's go
that's 200 kilometers an hour, 125 miles per hour, so that's about 60 to 125 miles. And yeah, once again, I think really cool, good performance. And the car also feels so uh, easy to handle when it is at speed. So that's really amazing. Your lane change at higher speed, really stable, good in control, good braking feel as well. And I mean, 170, 180 kilometers an hour here, and it's really, really silent. So the noise insulation is also just superb. Now on the brakes. Yeah, there the weight uh, comes into play, you know? So when you're really hard, a little bit hard on the brakes and you have to keep the car also in check, at some point you cannot deny physics. And what about some city driving here with the GLS? And first of all, you have to say for European roads, it's really too big. So <laughs> when I think about parking in and out of a basement garage or something, you really have to go like front, back, front, back, front, and it's like, will I ever get out here? So yeah, and I mean, in the US at least, you know, in the non-New England states, you have enough space also to move this beast around here, definitely. The V8, of course, gives you also a lot of calmness when you just keep it, you know, rolling and so on, and you can keep it really at low RPM. But then again, it's not the biggest difference than to the V6, that would be more than you know, what we experienced on, on the motorway. But if you think about the fuel economy then, here like 13, 13.5 13 liters on 100 kilometers is a realistic consumption value. And that would be about 18 mpg US or 22 mpg UK. And if you then think about that the six cylinder is quite efficient and you can rather drive it with nine to 10 liters on 100 kilometers, so about like six, seven miles per gallon more. Yeah, and also the, you know, the extra price, like more than 20,000 euros or dollars more for the eight cylinder. Of course, the eight cylinder is fun to drive, yes, but the six cylinder also brings less weight and has also good performance and as I said, better economy. So and then if you think about the extra price and also that only in the 450 at the moment, you can get the three color article seats from works. I think the choice is quite clear and that the six cylinder is the more clever choice. Here these different suspension modes, comfort of course with the air suspension, really comfortable like that. The special curve mode once again when being in the city, um, it's not, for my feeling, not as, you know, extremely tuned like in the GLE, the GLE leans more inside the corner and I'll talk to the engineers and they did that intentionally. So the GLS does not give you this super leaning in the corner feeling. It's more that the car just stays upright and you don't feel it's leaning to the outside. But you know, it feels a little bit more responsive by that. But honestly, I would rather have put this car with the rear axle steering that would have made turning circle and also like parking in and out easier. So I would prefer the rear axle steering over this curve mode where the car is leaning into the corner, I think. Also, I think that when you have this curve mode activated, I feel the suspension is somewhat less comfortable, comfortable just in running straight. So if you think e-active body control, does it make sense to go for it? I think not. I think it's not worth the extra price. I would just stick then with the normal air suspension and most of the time drive it in comfort mode. Sports mode, I mean, if you hammer it, really down like you know if you have a, the throttle down you also have a very good acceleration not necessarily need to go into sports mode the sports mode sport mode once again also yeah makes suspension a little bit stiffer steering a little bit more responsive but it's not the biggest difference then so usually fitting to this vehicle just cruising enjoying the silence enjoying the comfort the comfort mode is also the real fitting one Something I also mentioned in the interior part is when I'm just like driving relaxed like this here, left elbow here on the soft cushion on the left, which can also be heated and with an extra heating pack. That's really interesting. And on the right side then, I, you know, when I want to use the heating of the central console here, 
I would need to drive, you know, like this with my elbow back from the steering wheel that I can feel the heat of this. So I, I'm not even really sure, like, what's the use of that. I mean, maybe, yeah, for the co-driver, but for the driver, the thing is that you have your elbow right here, and this is exactly where the hard part of this middle console is, and when the soft part begins behind your elbow. So that's a little bit of a interior miscalculation as for the ergonomics or so. Yeah, I think we can easily live with that. Comfortable air suspension, good comfort also when the road is bumpy. Steering is really soft, as you can see here. Not too progressive, as we know from Mercedes, so you have to steer more than with the Volkswagen AG vehicles or with BMW. Um, it's not necessarily good or bad. I found it progressive better, you know, but that's my personal opinion. Maybe someone else likes to have a more comfortable driving when just running straight and doesn't appreciate that it turns too much, but overall it feels quite natural and it's totally fine. I also have this EQ charge meter or this EQ power meter, so there's also mild hybrid for the V8 here. But if it's really helping fuel economy wise, maybe a little, but it doesn't make the biggest difference, honestly. Other than that, considering it's a huge vehicle, it's still fun to drive it also in, you know, in normal street traffic and so on because it gives you this very sovereign feeling and if I now compare it to the all-new Mercedes S-Class here, you know, when you also decide between GLS and, and, and S-Class, you know, this MBUX infotainment system with this, um, you know, version as it is right here and also the control input on the steering wheel and so on, this has still the non-capacitive steering wheel, you know, with the real buttons. I found this car so much easier to handle than the all-new S-Class, which, you know, you more feel like being driven with by the car. This one here, you know, more direct. Like this, you know, at some point, more automatization. I mean, if you, like, automat automatize everything, okay, you know, for autonomous driving, but yeah, something in between, not sure if that's the right step. Another 50 to uh, 90, <laughs> about that, yeah. That's where, where the V8 comes handy, but yeah, once again, the inline six cylinder is also a very nice engine, and um, especially in the US, I've got so great consumption fingers with it. Must have been the missing particle filter thing as well. Yeah, that's sometimes the, the case that we have a better fuel economy with the cars in the US than because there are less filter installed, less filters installed. Now you're on the motorway, uh, you know, like with limited speed and as for the assistance systems, cruise control setting here on the left, and that's so easy, please just keep it. Why have to you, you update the E-Class facelift, new S-Class with these capacitive buttons on the steering wheel, looks cool, but feels cheap and also hard to use. Here, setting the cruise control, all good, all easy. Then we also have the active lane keeping assist in here. And it's not too intrusive actually. And even here in the construction lane, where the yellow markers are not usual for Germany, no problem for that vehicle here. Yeah, keeps me really centralized and I can really trust in that. Of course, never take your hands off the steering wheel. This was just for demonstration purposes and I was always ready to react. And once again, so calm and collected this vehicle. However, if you now compare it to the competitors, like a BMW X7, or yeah, Audi doesn't have like the longest direct competitor, would be more than the Audi Q7, which comes close to it. Um, the Audi and the BMW more feel driver involved, whereas the GLS then, in comparison to the competitors, also again feels more like you are being driven by the vehicle. And this also depends on what you prefer. If you more, you know, appreciate this laid back approach and enjoying more like a passive luxury, or if you want a more active luxury than as Audi and BMW do offer. So that's a little bit different, unique positions. And I always say, you know, like from this uh, more passive or more comfortable soft approach, it's more like Mercedes is here, Audi, BMW, and then Mercedes AMG. You know, because the AMG versions, each, they're really, really stiff and rough in the riding. So they have, I always say that Mercedes has the biggest jump from their non-sporty to their AMG models directly. Whereas 
Audi and BMW make it more, you know, in, a, in small transitions from their normal light performance models and the real performance models and so on. Switch to the right lane. Always nice to do lane change here. It's also quite fun to do that, definitely. Then traffic sign recognition sees it's now 100 kilometers an hour, 60 miles an hour, automatically increases the speed and puts the speed in this head up display is really large, so huge, this head up display in the projection end. Also quite clear and crisp. Hmm, I think I remember some GLE or GLS where it wasn't that crisp at first. Maybe they tweaked that a little bit, so I'm really happy with that definitely now. So, once again, one of the most relaxing and, you know, on the point, comfortable big SUVs here on the market. And now to our conclusion for today with the Mercedes GLS in this new generation. A more elegant and sporty look I think here, definitely with the new headlamps and so on. Stronger front grille even and the interior massively updated with this infotainment system. This is a big step forward and great luxury features indeed. The voice input is one of the best on the market besides this Android automotive system now used in the Polestar 2. And, you know, maybe in here and there a little bit better than the BMW. Some features they have that BMW doesn't have and also vice versa. Also great as for the massage seats, for example. Definitely, if you compare inline 6 versus the V8, the inline 6 cylinder is 20k cheaper and also is available then in the US with the three color Artigo seats, so black, beige or brown. So that's a massive advantage and also then the economy advantage that you get about eight miles per gallon more or about four liters and more kilometers less. So the V8 was fun to drive, also quite nice in the sound, but the six in it, of course, the more reasonable choice and it still is way than enough power for this vehicle, although it is big. It has so much comfort, air suspension, a great carpet alike ride, but not shaking too much and therefore you also do not need the additional curve function. So this e-active body control, it's a you know, very cost intensive extra and it's not really worth it to me. Just enjoy the normal air suspension and that's it. Also the six seater setup I found actually the coolest because the kids will have so much fun going in the rear and then going straight, you know, through the middle tunnel to the rear. This will, you know, this will be something to enjoy, enjoy all the time. It's also the standard configuration in the US. So as it stands down here right now on the inside, a really nice choice and definitely and this color here the beige color is also available in the article for the gls 450. a very impressive comfortable vehicle to me also more comfortable than the big luxury sedans and with this mbux generation to me also still very well to use in comparison to what mercedes is doing with the all new s class and now to our conclusion for today this was very interesting wasn't it the mercedes gla is the smallest one in the new generation, now indeed a compact SUV and not a crossover anymore, that's good. And it offers more space than before. However, it is indeed something like a put-up A-Class. It can get extremely expensive for its size, if you add some more features. That's the biggest catch of the GLA. Other than that, it is cool that already with the smallest SUV, you get the current MBOX infotainment system with voice input and so on. Both the GLA and the GLB offer the most extensive choices as for animal-free, high-quality seating, light fabric, high-grade leatherette and microfiber. Even cooled leatherette seats are available. Nice. The GLB does have the shorter hood and being on the compact segment platform, it has a maximum of four cylinders in the engine. But it uses the exterior space in a nice way. Actually, the GLB is to some extent the Mercedes SUV that is the most versatile one and even offers the most space on the interior for passengers. At the same time, it remains cheaper than the Mercedes GLC. The GLC has more design focus and also offers bigger engines. You feel a little bit more elaborated in the front cockpit, however the usage of space is not as good as in the GLB. It offers air suspension, which can be a significant comfort difference to the compact segment Mercedes SUVs. Overall, it is the oldest SUV model at this point, but was recently facelifted also with the MBOX infotainment. The Mercedes GLE delivers a very sophisticated driving experience and also even more seating comfort than the smaller brothers. 
It still offers sustainable seating materials if you choose wisely. Price and length further rise. However, you can also get a low-spec GLE instead of a high-spec GLC. The six-cylinder petrol engine is a good match with this GLE generation. The Mercedes GLS is basically a longer GLE if you need even more space with that additional seating row. However, it doesn't offer that much more space on the inside as you might expect, especially if you compare it to the baby GLS, the GLB. But the price is already higher and the extra price in comparison to the GLE is not really justified in my humble opinion. So where does that leave us finally? The overall price performance winner is the Mercedes GLB. It has the strongest off-road look and on the contrary the least sleek design focused appearance. A car you can use for a lot of things and you have as much space on the interior for passengers just like in the biggest SUVs. The Mercedes GLA is definitely nice, but too expensive for what it offers in comparison. The Mercedes GLC is maybe the sportiest in styling, and it can be a good compromise between the small and the very big ones. As second pick, however, I'd go with the GLE, if you have the money to step it up from the GLB. Since the GLE gives you this very sophisticated king of the road experience. The GLS is too big for some use cases and also comes with animal skin in a lot of cases. So my choice for today would be GLB for the price performance and GLE if you have more money left for that. What's your take and why? I'd be very interested to hear your comments. See you there.